Okay. All right. We're recording now. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Sorry, we're running a few minutes late and, mm -hmm. and some technical difficulties in the beginning, as as uh, I should have expected, mm -hmm. and um, and just getting every, everything, you know, getting all the all the all the things set up that you need to get set up. So, uh, my name is Stephen Prater. I think I know most people here, or most people at least know me a little bit from various other things that we do. And then uh, I'm gonna be uh, helping to monitor the chat. And then we also have Deanna Clemens, our other manager here. She's gonna help me monitor the chat, uh, the chat for uh, Sarah Benz and Jennifer Pierce. They're gonna be doing the main part of the presenting during this time. Uh, there'll be some parts where me and Deanna jump in. Uh, so the main part of this, the, the nine to two o'clock is gonna be about the coaching with Jennifer and Sarah. Now I did add a, a little 30 minute thing at the very end. Um, uh, that an opportunity came up that we could have a present a presenter from our instructional leadership uh, team here at TEA, and uh, that's going to be that's really only for our network grantees and their leadership. So everybody on this call doesn't need to to stay on after two o'clock. Only those those main network grantees and you know the the you know handful of people they consider their leadership people. Those are the only people that need to be a part of that. Everybody else can drop off at two o'clock. Uh, and uh, go on about your day. So, um, but that's it. That's all I have. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Benz and Jennifer Pierce and have them start our training about effective coaching practices. Hi, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, as you can see, we quickly went to our third slide because you guys are already introducing yourself up in the chat box. So it's like you anticipated this, like this isn't your first Zoom virtual training. So we appreciate that. Keep those rolling in the chat box. If you haven't already put it in the chat box, also include the number of years that you've been coaching, if that uh, makes sense. Um, it, it's okay. You don't even have to go back and do it. But if you haven't already, just put in the numbers of years that you've been coaching as well. So I have the distinct honor of introducing everybody. So uh, I think I know a lot of you on the call today. But for those of you don't. My name is Sarah Benz. Um, I'm a researcher at American Institutes for Research, and I provide technical assistance and professional development. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I provide professional development um, to multiple states, including Texas, under the National Center on Intensive Intervention and the National Center on Systemic Improvement. So really, this is a partnership with TEA and the National Center on Systemic Improvement. Really, my role is to bring uh, Texas rock stars like Jennifer Pierce. So today, you are going to be learning a little bit about coaching from Jennifer Pierce. She's a senior technical assistant consultant and researcher from AIR, and she has had experience working with um, as a teacher, coach, building level, and district level leader. She also served in higher education as an instructor and a researcher. Her areas of expertise include supporting the implementation of evidence-based interventions by teachers and in schools, including teacher and systems coaching models to reduce the research to practice gap, implementation science and systemic change, uh, including frameworks across fields and factors associated with the sustained use of evidence-based interventions and the application of multi-tiered systems of support across general and special education. Dr. Pierce also has a background in literacy instruction for struggling learners. Um, at AIR, Dr. Pierce is the project director for an IES-funded study examining the psychometric properties of an MTSS fidelity tool, and she also leads coaching and systems change projects for the National Center on Systemic Improvement. Uh, Dr. Pierce has authored um, several peer-reviewed articles and numerous tools, including the online coaching model that you guys should have pre-watched before this, and she recently co-led the Global Imp Implementation Society Standards Committee. Uh, currently, she literally wrote a book on coaching. She is the author on the book on coaching, um, and it's specifically to improve teaching, learning, and educational systems. So she earned her PhD in special education from the University of Washington, and she, right now she lives in New York City. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Jennifer Pierce. Um, the other person on the slide, Tom Jones, you will hear from him over a video, um, and he will be able to introduce himself better than I ever would on that video. So right this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pierce. 
Great, thank you. And a uh, little thumbs up there if you can hear me, uh, anyone. There we go, okay, I saw that. All right, let's take a quick peek at our agenda for today. Um, we are going to just quickly talk about uh, the session outcomes, some logistics, we will blaze right through that. Uh, and then we're gonna dig right into um, what what is going to be the bulk of our time today, uh, examining effective coaching practices. And this should overlap with what you learned in the module, but also extend uh, that information. Um, within that first part of the day from 9, 10-ish, which is actually right now, um, through about 11 o'clock, we're gonna hit some also high-level research findings on coaching. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, a recent document that TEA put together about a Texas coaching definition. We will take a um, hour and 15 long minute break for lunch. We will tag on to that an independent activity that includes uh, watching a, a very short model, or I'm sorry, a very short video of a teacher instructing. It's about six minutes. Um, and then from 12.15 to 1.15, we're going to continue to talk about effective coaching practices. Um, the next part of the agenda is uh, in italics because this is where we're going to have a little bit of wiggle room. So our intention is to show you that 15-minute video about virtual coaching. If we find that we are progressing at a little bit of a different pace and we want to slow down in some of the prior parts um, of the content and dig into that a little bit deeper, deeper we will uh, table that video and then provide that to you so that you can view that in another opportunity. And then we'll wrap up our day, of course, by um, talking about your next steps and hopefully giving some uh, useful resources. And then we will send you on your way to the next part of your day here today, which I um, heard Stephen say is at about an, an additional 30 minutes. I do want to... Um, ease any concerns that you might have about breaks. We are, in addition to that hour and 15 minute lunch break, we do have activities and breaks embedded throughout the session. However, and this is getting into our um, norms, I'm gonna uh, flash forward here for, for just a second. Um, if you find that you need to take a break at a at time that's not kind of like designated as a break, please feel free to do so. Um, I already see that most of you and many of you have on your cameras. Sometimes that starts to impact our Wi-Fi connection. So, um, you know, or if you have other things happening and you need to turn off your camera, camera, please feel free to do so. But the other thing that I want to mention here on our norms and kind of our logistics for today is that we're really hoping that this is not a sit and get webinar. Even though we have, it looks like, about 227 participants um, on this call today, which is phenomenal, by the way. Kudos to all of you. Very excited about that. Um, please feel free to take advantage of the opportunities that we have for interacting with us. Um, our main mechanism for interacting is the chat box. Uh, so, boy, that's going to be a, a big task for our TEA and Sarah Ben's uh, team to kind of monitor and stay on top of that. But please feel free to pop questions into that or if that's just getting too cumbersome and you find that you know they, your question is just really pressing and you need to have that um, responded to hop on the phone line I would love to hear your voices we absolutely welcome that um, and then if you're not going to you know raise a question um, please feel free or please make sure that your phone line is muted and that's been um, that you know usually helps offset anyone who's like making their their uh, additional phone calls that are necessary Necessary throughout the day um, and another thing that I'll mention about hopping onto the phone line um, don't hesitate to interrupt me this is your session not my session so I absolutely do not mind if you um, if you find that you'd like to kind of um, interrupt something that I'm saying please feel free to do so I absolutely welcome that all right I'm gonna go back to our outcomes here um, for the session um, which are obviously shown on this slide and linked to our agenda and how we structured the day. We really want to spend most of our time unpacking, digging deeper into the four effective coaching practices that hopefully, fingers crossed, you learned about in the module. Um, but we also want to provide some resources and help you understand how to begin to use those practices. And so um, that should, by the end of our session, be something that you feel comfortable with, um, not just your knowledge of those practices, but how to use them. 
You did receive some um, materials. Uh, I believe that we, they were posted in the invitation of the um, for the Zoom call. We have one PDF of uh, which is a combination of four handouts. They're listed on this slide. Um, there's a, you know kind of like a lo one long PDF. Plus we have a PDF of the slides. There have been some changes. Uh, if you do professional learning sessions, workshops, trainings, it, you might be like me where I'm making last minute edits uh, to the slides. So they should be pretty much the same, but there will be some minor variations of that um, PDF that you have and what you're looking at here on the screen. And then we also provided a Word version of one of the PDF documents, um, the coaching protocol. And that is something that you might want to use to take notes in in the moment of this session um, or that you could use at a later date um, as a protocol for when you are conducting sessions with teachers. All right, um, whirlwind there and uh, I'm going to go ahead and move right on unless there's anything in the chat box, Sarah, Deanna, or Stephen that I should attend to. I'm going to get right into the research on, on coaching. All right, thumbs up. Thank you, Sarah. All right, uh, again, overlap from what you learned in the module, but hopefully extending that out. And this is something that also probably syncs up to your own experience. We know that there are many models of coaching out there in both research and in practice. We have um, what I refer to as teacher coaching, um, which uh, in the literature might be called, and in your practice might be called, literacy coaching, reading coaching, behavior coaching, or instructional coaching. I refer to those as teacher coaching because of the recipient. Regardless of what the content is of that coaching, the person who is being coached is the teacher, and that's why I refer to all of those kind of under the umbrella term of teacher coaching, and that is the emphasis of our time today. Now, you might have heard about systems coaching, maybe you are are a systems coach and I just want to make sure to draw a dis, um, to distinguish between a systems coach and a teacher coach the systems coach is generally someone who provides support to an implementation team at a school or a district so for example PBIS often have systems coaches um, and RTI teams might have a system coach where the coach is going in to support that uh, implementation team to improve school system level outcomes. In contrast to the teacher coaching, which is generally about improving the teacher's practice and student outcomes. Now, to make things complicated, there are, um, are often hybrid models. And in fact, that PBIS example, I would I think tends to often fall into a hybrid type of coaching, where a coach might be working with a PBS school leadership team and also provide support to individual teachers within a school. And so I bring all of this to your attention again to reinforce the idea that we are talking about teacher level coaching here, but there are those other models of coaching that you may be familiar with. Excuse me, Go. this is the sign language interpreter speaking. Could we just get a moment to switch interpreters? Absolutely. I found Thank you so very much. We're ready. Okay, great. All right, so continuing along with that um, idea of variations in coaching that we see in research as well as in practice, um, the coach is there's also a lot of variation in who serves as a coach in research we know that the researchers conducting studies often put themselves in the position of being coaches we see experienced teachers as coaches we see sometimes newer teachers with less than five years of experience serving as a coach um, but the bottom line here is that there is a lot of variation in who is the coach as well as to what I alluded to before as who is the recipient or the coach e um, this might be a pre service teacher, someone who is still learning about uh, the science of teaching. This might be an experienced or even a novice teacher in their first five years of, of, uh, of teaching. And so the variations are just really out there for you to, to experience and sometimes kind of muddy the waters as to what we're talking about when we are referencing coaching. 
Now, something that you might be familiar with is the variations of the coaching format. And given our current context, um, you might be uh, already coaching or planning to coach using a virtual environment like a Zoom meeting. Um, that's something that has actually shown up a lot in the research over the past 10 to 15 years. And we know a lot about virtual coaching, and I'll, I'll speak to that coming up here. Um, and then the topic of coaching um, also varies quite extensively. And even from what I understand among your networks, you have specific topics that you provide training and support to teachers on. Um, and then we'll also have some variation in the content or the topic in which you will be coaching. Now, the, um, the good, there is some good news here, even though there is that muddiness of the different kind of permutations of coaching that are out there in research practice. We do know that the purpose of coaching, teacher level coaching, is that bridge from knowing to doing. And um, going back to the module, back in the 1980s, Joyce and Showers really kicked off this idea that coaching paired with training is really the powerful secret sauce. And if we're looking for changes in practice and teacher level practice, and to some degree student outcomes, that pairing that training and coaching is absolutely critical because training alone will only result in changes in knowledge. And we just can't expect to see changes in implementation or practice from training alone. Now, these findings are echoed even very recently. Um, Kraft and colleagues in 2018 uh, published a really interesting meta-analysis, a combination of 60 studies, experimental studies, that looked at the impact of coaching on not just teacher practice, but on student outcomes. And what they found was that was very consistent with what Joyce and Showers found in the 80s, and that is that coaching can be extremely powerful. Uh, in changing teacher practice. Now, you're probably familiar with effect sizes, and basically what that means is that teachers who received coaching in comparison to teachers who did not, um, those teachers who received that coaching, the kind of the treatment group teachers, they really showed a marked improvement. And an effect size in education is about 2.5 or so, three, generally considered to be pretty important and powerful. So an effect size of 0.71 is um, something to take note of, that the buzz that you hear and the potential of coaching can be played out, not just just in research, but also in practice. And I want to mention here also the student learning outcome that Kraft and colleagues found in that meta-analysis. It is definitely less than, um, than what that change and improvement is that they found in teacher practice, but that's actually probably not that surprising given that the coach doesn't have that direct impact on student learning. The coach and to the teacher and the teacher to the student. So there is that, um, that intermediary between between the coach and the student, and so we wouldn't really expect such powerful results, but a point um, one um, effect size is nothing to, to laugh at either. So it is something that, you know, when we say that improving coaching or coaching can lead to improve teaching and student learning outcomes, we do have um, some solid ground to stand on to make that claim. All right, now, but with that said, uh, and again, hearkening back to the module that you watched, not all coaching can lead to these improved outcomes, improved teacher practice and student outcomes. We know that the job of a coach is very challenging, and I've got about three uh, challenges that are listed on this slide that might have been something that you're quite familiar with. I know when I started out as a coach, I went from being a teacher to a coach with no preparation whatsoever. There was no no uh, formal training program that I uh, had access to, and there are still very few across the country for coaches. Um, there are more in the past 20 years or so, I would say there have been more. Um, and there are few learning opportunities for coaches, but uh, once they're in the job, but again, those opportunities are starting to increase. Job descriptions are also very broad um, it, for coaches. They are often expected to directly work with students, work with teachers, maybe substitute for teachers, do lunch duty. There, um, some of them are also mm -hmm. in some kind of a, like a quasi-administrator role. And so this can be a bit of a challenge of how do you find time to conduct the work of a coach to see those improved teaching and student learning outcomes. And then the third one that I have here, I think is 
is extremely important um, and just kind of compounds with the other two barriers because when we see that coaching sessions are not based on what we know to be very powerful coaching practices, um, we can run into some trouble. And um, a lot of coaches uh, view coaching as some kind of an amorphous activity that is hard to put boundaries on and really hard to articulate what is effective coaching practice. And I think as a field, we have, we're doing a better job of articulating what those effective coaching practices are, and we can do a better job in making sure that coaches know and understand and are able to use effective coaching practices. And before I go on here, I just want to also acknowledge that um, I also want to acknowledge the reality of uh, COVID-19 um, and that this clearly impacts every aspect of our lives today and the same could be said for our work with teachers. And so I don't want to dismiss um, the pandemic on the work that we, um, the, the work of our jobs of the day to day. And this is something that we haven't yet studied um, with respect to coaching, but we can anticipate that there will be some bumps in the road when it comes to coaching due to the pandemic. All right, now when we see that these challenges are in place, um, we know that coaching sessions may not focus on the most powerful practices. And I've said that before, and I will say that again, because it's so important. When coaching sessions do not focus in on the most powerful or effective research-based coaching practices, then we simply can't expect to see improved teaching and student learning outcomes, which are the goals of coaching. In addition to that, we might hear that there's some question um, about coaching and is it worth it? Is it worth the time and the money that we're spending on it and support um, in the school or at the district or even across a region or state might uh, wane for um, wane when it comes to coaching. And as I just said, the goals of coaching may not be attainable uh, if we don't really hone in and focus that coaching practice on those effective coaching, uh, coaching behaviors. So that is the good news is that when we learn and enact those coaching practices and when they are articulated and communicated across a system, we know that we um, have the increased likelihood of seeing improved teaching and student learning. All right, so this is an engagement opportunity for you. Think fast, back to the module. Um, what are those coaching practices that I have been referencing um, that are most closely linked to improved teaching and student learning? There are four that you learned about in the module. And so go ahead and think about that. And then if your last name is A through M, pop your response into the chat box, please. All right, so I'm pulling up the chat box and I see modeling, observation is coming up, providing performance feedback, alliance building, um, A through M, you have got it. You probably could be leading this session. I am um, giving you the high fives and applause for <laughs> your recollection of what those, of what those practices are. Uh, and if we check our answers here, this is a screenshot from that module. And you can see what I just said from the chat boxes reflected here in, um, in this graphic that uh, effective coaching practices are those ongoing cycles consisting of the pre-conference, an observation, and a post-conference where uh, coaches would not just observe but would model, um, build alliance, and then provide that performance feedback. And before I move on, I also want to acknowledge um, that these coaching practices can be readily integrated into whatever type of coaching sessions you might anticipate running or maybe that you have conducted in the past and that they're kind of agnostic. So perhaps you are familiar with Jim Knight's um, model of coaching or another model of coaching. Um, there are some um, 
models that are, exist in the pre-K setting, as well as some data-based decision-making coaching models. And there really is a very strong overlap with using these practices and integrating them into whatever type of coaching sessions you, um, you have heard about or have maybe planned to conduct in the future. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen and Deanna um, to quickly talk about um, the Texas definition of coaching. And um, you might want to pull up the handout that's related to this as, as we talk through it, but I'll keep the slides projected out here. All right, Stephen and Deanna. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about this first part and then I'm going to turn it over to Deanna when we start talking about the actual um, coaching handout that, uh, that, that Jennifer is referencing. Um, so basically I'm gonna kind of talk about two things at once here. Um, first of all, like why we decided to do this and then how we did it. And so uh, the reason why we wanted to do this because we were giving all of our networks, um, we were saying like, we want y'all to do more coaching. We want you to do more coaching, co coaching and less creating of materials. And so this, this is why, um, when we said to uh, when we said to all the networks, uh, we, we're having them do a landscape analysis now, where we're saying, look at all the OSEP sites, look at all those national sites. They already create a lot of the things that either we can use or use as part of things that we're creating. So we're, we're trying to give uh, networks tools to stop creating as many things as they think they need to, because uh, we want them to concentrate more on the actual implementation of of these practices. And so that's why we're trying to move to the coaching. So we, we, we kept telling coaches or networks we wanted them to coach more. Uh, of course, Deanna, Deanna and I, you know, we're, we're uh, amateur coaches, but definitely not professionals, definitely not experts. And so that's why we kind of leaned on NCI, NCSI and Jennifer and Sarah to, uh, to bring these coaching practices to y'all. We wanted y'all to give all the best practices and, uh, and have somebody deliver the information that, that actually you know, is an expert and knows what they're talking about. So uh, that's, that's the reason why we did that. And so the way we did it is we created that, if you wanna to go to the next uh, slide, Jennifer, we created this little form here that I'll let Deanna talk a little bit more about. And we, we, we created it with NCSI, they helped us to create it. Um, we sent it out to our network uh, grantees to kind of get feedback on it and to ask questions about it. And then we, we came back and, and, and had a more final uh, product, which is this one that you see here. And I'm gonna let Deanna talk a little more about it. No, I think you said what I was going to say. Um, no, we, this definition of coaching, when we started, we kept Justin Porter, you know, our boss, the director of special ed for Texas, he would say, we need to get doing more coaching. We need to be boots on the ground out with teachers doing more coaching. Um, and we all kind of thought, well, we, we know what coaching means. And then the more we talked about it, we realized internally on our team at TEA and then with like our grantees and ESCs that we all maybe had slightly different versions of what coaching might mean. So that kind of really prompted us to just make kind of a concise definition of coaching and what we mean by a coaching cycle. Um, and so that's what you see on the handout. And then we are just starting this year to go down the road of collecting coaching data. And so we, um, we have, have some asks of our grantees to provide data quarterly about coaching sessions that we're doing um, out in the field. And then we're going to be doing some fidelity collection when we have you guys as network members. If you're doing coaching with a teacher, we're going, your network leads or the grantees are going to be asking you to complete some data in a Qualtrics survey that will report back to us so we can start to look at um, how do teachers implement practices after just training alone. How do they implement after one coaching cycle, two coaching cycles, three coaching cycles, et cetera. So we're just really getting our feet wet with it this year. We've been talking about coaching in the last year or so, but in 2021, we're really saying, let's, let's get some foundational training. Let's get common definitions for what we mean by coaching. So when we say a coaching cycle, we all kind of have the same definition in mind um, that we know that it's going to include that observation and modeling and performance feedback. Um, so that's really what we're doing throughout this year is just starting down this path of really, really moving towards implementation on some of this coaching talk here. That's why we have Jennifer here today.
is our contact with, with NCII and NCSI. Um, Stephen and I always know when we're out of our depth and when our bosses told us we were gonna need to do more support to networks on round coaching, I was like, that's, that's not my area of expertise not Stevens either. So we pulled in some experts who are super grateful to have Jennifer helping us. And so throughout this year, us at TEA, we have all of our technical assistance team on this um, training as well. And throughout the year, as we engage with, um, with Jennifer and some calls and some follow-up coaching and training, we hope to grow our staff and our knowledge base on coaching so that we can continue long-term to support around coaching. So this is a a learning opportunity for us at the agency as well to learn from from some experts um, and make sure that when we talk about coaching that we are grounding it on those effective practices that come from their research so um, that that will be us learning along with you guys this year and just again Jennifer we're grateful to have you supporting TEA in this work and it's another way that TEA is saying when we when we need support, we're reaching out to national centers as well to come alongside of us and support us in growing our technical assistance, coach us so that we can continue to improve as well. Great, thank you, uh, Stephen and Deanna. And I do want to also just acknowledge that this is pretty different. Um, taking a strategic approach to defining coaching and to implementing coaching is pretty atypical. A lot of times we hire coaches and go forth and prosper is kind of the approach. And so taking a step back to um, not just identify the coaching role and the need for it, but to put some parameters and expectations and support around it is something that definitely should be applauded. So um, kudos to everyone for being a part of that process. All right, I am going to dig in now into um, the first of our um, effective coaching practices using alliance strategies. And I'm going to refer to this as not just alliance building strategies, but actually alliance strategies. Because one of the things since the time I put together the module and um, started to you know really use that language is that it became clear that calling them alliance building strategies implied that they were only important, these strategies were only important in the beginning, or that they were only important if a teacher coach dyad made Maybe didn't have that strong of a relationship and that actually is not the case these are strategies that are important um, throughout the life of a coaching um, situation and regardless of where the teacher coach dyad is in their alliance they're important strategies to to use to build and maintain and further develop this is the interpreter sorry I was waiting for a quick break it's time to switch okay great Okay, I think I see the thumbs up. We're ready to go. I'm still oh. waiting for her. I'm waiting for her to oh. give me the thumbs up. Okay, Got it. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so you can see here on, on the slide here in the chat box, once again, last name N through Z. Um, brush off those cobwebs from the module and uh, try to recall what alliance strategies are um, from, that, from that module. And I see some chats are, are coming in here. We have trust building, um, non-evaluative language conveying expertise, um, observable strategies that coaches use, relationship building um, and collaboration. Wonderful, these are all um, absolutely on point with what Alliance strategies are. And uh, I do wanna pull out the idea here that these are observable behaviors. A lot of times we think about building relationship as something that is kind of amorphous. And it's hard to really define what it is that we do that builds positive relationships. And it turns out from not just coaching research, but going into research um, between in the mental health and counseling field, Fields, which are actually sometimes very much like coaching, is that we can find that there are concrete, observable behaviors coaches can use to build and maintain alliance with teachers. And the whole goal is just that, to ensure that there is that strong foundation for whatever work is going to uh, transpire between the dyad of the teacher and the coach. 
And you also know from the module that Alliance matters. Um, Joe Webby back in 2012 and colleagues put, uh, ran a study on coaches looking at alliance between teachers and coaches. And what they found was that those uh, teacher coach dyads with less than positive alliance, maybe more negative alliance, um, the teachers who were in those dyads showed lower levels of fidelity of practice. Now this was a correlational study, so we can't draw causal conclusions from it, but we do know that that alliance matters and when we care about fidelity of practice then we know that um, alliance can come into play to influence and shape um, the teacher fidelity of practice. The core task of um, using alliance strategies is to be flexible. And uh, sometimes, you know, we think about what those strategies are, and I'm actually going to flash forward here to uh, the three categories of alliance strategies and, you know, try to think about, okay, do I need to do um, a specific alliance strategy every single time at the beginning of every single session with, with teachers? And the answer to that is no, that we can be very flexible in our use of these alliance strategies, and we should be based on the dynamic that we currently have with the teachers that we are supporting. So this slide here um, unpacks a little bit more deeply what those alliance strategies are, and I've highlighted some of them that are different and new, not included in the module, or ones that um, in the coaching research um, are, are shown to be particularly important um, in teacher-coach uh, dyads. Um, and you can see the first one that is in bold font there is asking those open-ended questions. And um, this is something probably not surprisingly that when we take that coaching stance, it's not about us being directive and constantly um, telling people information. A lot of our coaching stance is about eliciting information. And so how can we ask open-ended questions? What are those questions going to be? And that is a very powerful alliance strategy um, that really is, um, important to integrate into coaching sessions. The other one that I think comes up quite often in my conversations with coaches is the idea of jointly setting goals. Uh, sometimes as a coach, because we are experts in our fields, we can see problems very readily. And so we might be observing um, a classroom F in a particular area that we are very familiar with, and we know a teacher would benefit and students would benefit from developing in um, certain ways. Uh, based on what's happening in that classroom. However, as a coach, we have to kind of put that to the side, keep it in our mind, but not let that fully dictate the coaching sessions that we conduct with teachers. And it's in a way, it's like teaching. We often see where kids need to grow and develop, and that's important for us to shape that pathway. In coaching, we can keep that idea in mind of where we want that development and where we know is important for that teacher develop, to develop, but we don't have to direct that. We can guide that, uh, that path into that area. Um, and having that goal set based on the needs of the teacher is absolutely important. So kind of putting our needs to the side and drawing out through those open-ended questions what the goals of the teacher are and starting there. Further down the road, as you have conducted more coaching sessions, maybe you have a very strong alliance with that teacher and they are very trusting of your insight and guidance. That might be benefit. 
mentioned in the coaching module, but uh, since the time that I developed that module and then in talking with teachers and just learning and coaches and learning more and more about the coaching process, one of the things that we're, we're finding in Alliance is that when coaches and teachers aren't clear of what is going to happen in um, coaching cycles, then we can start to see some ruptures in relationships. So it's important to really demystify what is going to happen, what teachers can expect and what you will do as a part of coaching cycles um, in that trust build and when you are building that and maintaining that alliance with teachers. I'm going to stop right there because um, I'm actually going to um, before I move into our activity here, I'm, I'm going to open the phone line, uh, go out on the limb here and see if there's any questions about any of the alliance strategies. Um, and knowing that in a few moments, um, we're going to have you kind of brainstorm some of those alliance strategies that you might use. Um, but I do want to just make sure that there are any questions or comments that we kind of address those before we move on. And if you're too shy to speak up, if you put it in chat, Deanna or I can read it out for you. Oh, I see someone's raising a hand. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my name is Deanna. I just wanted to um, call a little attention to showing humility, which I think is so important you know um this is a, a partnership and a collaboration and um and i think if if we jump in as the all-knowing um person uh in the relationship that that can certainly damage um our alliance you are absolutely correct there and on point deanna um and teachers might feel comfortable or want to kind of put us in that role of being the expert with all of the answers and acknowledging the teacher's professional wisdom and having that humility is absolutely an important part of uh, building and maintaining alliance. Thanks for that comment, Deanna, and for being so brave and jumping onto the phone line there. I really appreciate that. And I'll build on that a little bit too, because I just know, I know how our networks work. And I know that at ESCs, there may be the, the people, uh, a specialist at the ESC may have two or three networks that they're supposed to be in charge of. So maybe they may be an expert in say in autism, so they're part of TSLAP, but then maybe they're also a part of TIER or they're also a part of transition network. Maybe they aren't experts in those areas. So those are the, so, so what y'all are saying is right. It's like, we may not be the expert in that area, but we, as long as we are familiar with our training and familiar with the coaching, then we can still be assets to the teachers. So. Absolutely. And that harkens to the idea of developing together and being comfortable with um, not having all the answers and really demonstrating that to teachers goes a long way, especially if they're really struggling, um, maybe starting up something new or um, uncomfortable with what uh, it is that they have to uh, do now. I mean, think about the climate we're in where teachers are virtually teaching and, you know, this is a whole new arena that, that they have encountered and been a part of for however for many months now and that can be uh, daunting and so communicating to teachers you know I, I may not be the expert in this but we're gonna figure this out because we're in this together um, important strategies and I see a lot of really powerful comments in the chat box um, I think maybe dr. Reyes mentioned uh, connecting with someone culturally and understanding who they are and where they come from and how that can come into play with building that strong alliance um, and maintaining that strong alliance with the teacher um, really important um, part of, of being uh, the coach and you can see here in this whole conversation that where the overlaps that we have with coaching and um, providing counseling and support in a therapeutic kind of context a lot of times we do feel like that as, as coaches and that might be something you're familiar with I'm just gonna go back here for a second just to make sure that there isn't anything here that um, I need to touch on. And actually I'm looking at this slide and I just wanna really quickly point out, and I think I've said this, but 
you know, definitely worth mentioning again is that these alliance strategies happen at every step of the way of the coaching cycle, whether you're in that um, uh, pre-observation or pre-conference to the observation or to the post-conference is that, you know, these are just something that you're constantly integrating in. All right, so let's um, take a peek at one of the handouts that you have. It is, let me look here, uh, handout three, section A. So that is that PDF that, um, that you have, uh, hopefully at your fingertips. We're gonna ask that, that you kind of pretend, um, put yourself in the shoes of being a coach who's just about to hold a pre-conference with a teacher and then you're getting ready to observe him or her. Um, identify uh, some alliance strategies that you would use during the pre-conference, um, especially those open-ended questions, and then be ready for the next step. We've got 9.50, but that's actually like two minutes ago, so we'll have to adjust that time, but, but take about five minutes, so, or let's say about yeah, let's say about five minutes. So I have 9.52. Uh, so in about five minutes from now, let's get ready to come back um, and kind of share out. This is also an opportune time for you to run to get another cup of coffee, use the loo, grab some water, stretch your legs, do what you need to do. Um, but you can record those Alliance strategies in that handout, the Word version of that, or you can just copy these into your notes. So let's take about five minutes and then I'll see you on the other side. We're gonna 
restart here in about a minute or so. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us back into uh, conversation here. Um, so I think Tammy maybe anticipated in the chat what I was going to ask. So if you have a fall birthday, September, October, November, put, uh, if you could please, put one open-ended question that you would use during a pre-conference, put that into the chat box. And even if you don't have a fall birthday, none of us will ever know. So please feel free <laughs> to, to pop those in there. I'm sure this is something that if you've coached before, you're, you're pretty good at coming up with some open, oops, open-ended questions. And I think I'm starting to see, oh, really great ones coming in. Um, what are some ideas or experiences you have? Tell me about yourself. Tell me about a lesson where, one of your, what is your greatest strength? Um, Let's see, what is your favorite part of teaching? What is the goal that I can help support you with? Um, these are all fantastic open-ended questions. Pop open that chat box and, and take a peek um, at those if you haven't already. And then here, we're gonna call on those brave souls again. So please, let's hop off that phone line. We have 224 participants. So we have to at least have a couple of people who are brave enough to talk over the phone line. Um, but let's, uh, let's wrap up any kind of questions or comments that you have, reactions about Alliance strategies um, before we move on to the next effective coaching practice, which is observation. So let's make sure we wrap this one up before we move on. We've got a lot more phone line opportunities coming up. It'll be great to hear your voices. Jennifer, I have a quick question. Sure. I'm, my name, I'm Kia Sala, I'm from Region 10. Um, is there, are there particular alliance strategies or things we can do that you think would be beneficial um, when we're doing what I will, would kindly refer to as involuntary coaching mm. um, to when we're coaching in a situation where maybe the the client doesn't want that coaching to go on or is, is there anything in these strategies that would be particularly helpful there excuse me this is the other interpreter we need to switch interpreters again so could we do that before you answer that question absolutely yeah thank you i'll let you know when we're ready thank you so much great We're good, thank you. All right, well, I'm actually gonna throw this question back out to our audience um, over the phone line or through the chat um, because I'm sure that many of you have encountered this experience before and have some insight into it. And I'd love to hear your, um, your responses to this really great question before I hop in. Can you repeat the question again, please? Yes, I was just thinking with regard to these alliance strategies or these ways of, of building the connections, um, is there anything that would be particularly useful when we're doing coaching with someone where this coaching was directed? Um, it was more maybe, you know, a supervisor is saying you need to come coach this person even though they may not be interested in receiving the coaching. This is Daniel Rigney from Region 13. Uh, one strategy or one protocol that I've been reading about and experimenting with is called motivational interviewing, uh, which is a little more complex than I think we're probably going to get to here. But the general idea is there are certain questions and 
um, ways of thinking about how to talk to someone that helps them uh, to helps to motivate them in certain ways. So it might include uh, positively reinforcing their change language when they say, oh, I was thinking about doing X, Y, and Z, positively reinforcing that. And then if they're kind of talking about ways that they're still stuck, not necessarily reinforcing that kind of language. Uh, very simple way of describing it, but maybe Jennifer has some uh, a better way of saying it. No, could you... Could you restate the, the technique again? Uh, I'll let Jennifer describe it. Uh, she'll probably... I think what I heard was motivational interviewing, which is um, a, a kind of a structured way of working with someone who is uncomfortable or not ready to make a change, but that change is important. Um, you'll see motivational interviewing happening in contexts, um, counseling or therapeutic contexts, actually, with drug and alcohol and substance abuse. So it is a very... Um, gentle and guided yet and structured approach to taking one step at a time to making a change. And uh, if you're not familiar with motivational interviewing, check it out. It, it, um, there have been some, uh, a lot of applications of that to the education and coaching world. Um, so that's a great way to, um, there's like a series of four or five questions even that you could check out. And off the top of my head, I can't think of what they are exactly, but the idea Idea is to gently framing the idea of one little step at a time and what can I do to help what is that step that you'd like to make how willing are you to make that what can we do together to make that to take that step that's kind of the gist of the line of questioning um, so that might be worth something that is uh, that is worth checking out. And the idea of, even if you didn't go down that road of motivational um, interviewing, the idea is that you are, um, you're, you're setting the tone that we're in this together and that I am here to help you. This is not about me being directive. This is not me about setting the pace or the tone. This is about us working together. And even in that context where it is something that the teacher um, or the coachee is um, required to participate in is an important part of, of that coaching context. I see a lot of different ideas popping into the, the um, chat box. Um, look at those to see uh, what you might be able to get out of out of uh, that type of a situation and you know what you can what you can do other questions or comments i think twinkle has a question she has her hand raised and then uh, emily robinson put a question in the chat that i'll read after twinkle goes okay it wasn't so much a, a question as another comment because of us who um, have been in this situation in our educational career for a number of years, we we harken back to the days of Tina's teacher in need of assistance. Um, I, I was always one kind of felt like you know if that's a situation when someone feels like they've been assigned a coach or something, this that first meeting, like I said, I like that I you know find, I used to, and I do I use Sonic Happy Hour because it's the only happy hour we can have during working hours. But visiting with the teacher and letting her or him have an opportunity just to vent about what's been going on, because they probably already know you've been asked to come in and assist them, you know, and then let them know we're in this together. And we certainly want to meet the needs of your administrator who might have, but I think just letting them have that opportunity to see how they feel like things are going. Because then you get a feel about where they are in the situation. They feel like they've been attacked. They feel like they haven't been understood. You know, and then say, okay, how do we go forward with this? And, and you come up with a plan together. I think that's just real important. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think that was Twinkle who was sharing out how to maybe approach that situation. And just continuing along in the, in the chat, box, chat box, I see Anne has a really important comment about um, the distinction, distinction between um, the purpose of coaching when someone is kind of that willing and 
um, recipient of it or participant in it, and then when we are required to coach and how data will be used in both of those situations. And this is part of demystifying the coaching cycle. Um, whether coaching is required or whether it is voluntary, make it clear how coaching data will be used and clear what data will be collected and how you will talk about it with the teacher and then what will be shared with, um, with administrators um, and what will not be shared. And so that's another really important part of um, demystifying that coaching cycle and the purpose of it. So thanks for bringing up that, that uh, comment. It gets at the, um, Albert mentions it being honest and transparent about why you have to work with, um, work with that particular, with that particular teacher. Great, great comments and questions. So Emily uh, asked a question a while back and said, how can we engage cultural awareness in coaching? Mm, let's, let's hear from the audience on this one too. Hi, this is Jeanette from Region 1. Hi, Jeanette. I believe the question was, how can we engage cultural awareness in coaching? Um, speaking as a Latina, um, I believe that uh, I do connections. I connect with people by just discussing family, um, discussing just if I see photos of children in, in their classroom, I ask about, you know, is that your family? Are those your nieces, nephews? Are those your personal children? So try to establish a connection that is um, on the personal level um, before we even dig into an agenda of coaching. That's one thing that helps with me. Um, there's actually a model um, for this that I found really interesting. I recently read about this and was, was working on this with some um, of the evaluation staff that I support. It's called Participatory Culture Specific Consultation or PCSC. Um, and it provides a framework for doing coaching that includes uh, some pre-work um, to do to hope to consider um, some of these issues related to um, culturally responsive practice um, before beginning the work of um, that coaching and consultation with the individual. These are great resources. Thank you for, um, for sharing that. And if you didn't put that into the chat box, please be sure to, to do so. Um, anything else? that we want to um, discuss, get out there, questions, comments, confusions um, related to alliance. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to um, two more of those coaching practices that have the strongest um, basis in research. We're going to talk um, about observation and modeling next. And uh, this is uh, just a uh, Harkening back again to the online module that you watched, obviously observation is the middle part of that coaching cycle. And this, we have our definition here, which again is very obvious. This is when you are watching what is happening in the classroom. Um, maybe the teacher is using a specific program, practice, or intervention. And um, even though it seems very obvious that it's important to observe classroom teaching, um, I think it's important for us to make it explicit that this is a part of coaching and that um, it is a part of coaching because the goal of the observation is to understand what the links are between what the teacher does and what the student is learning or whatever kind of um, outcomes it is that that we would expect to have happen we want to look for those links between teaching and uh, teachers and students and of course the goal is always to build and maintain positive alliance so if we're looking for links between teaching and um, 
in student learning, then clearly a core task of an observation is to collect data. And then the question becomes, well, what kind of data do we think that we might collect? Um, many of you uh, have fidelity tools that you've probably used in the past, um, maybe looking at the dose of instruction or student um, responsiveness, the quality of the um, teacher's use of the practice, maybe adherence to critical components. Um, and this could be, you know, teacher level data in any subject area, um, behavior or social emotional supports. Um, it could be, as I just said, the classroom management um, type of um, teacher level data where we're looking at very um, specific areas of classroom management like ratio of interactions or on and off task uh, behavior. So um, if you look at handout three again, you'll see that section B has um, a table for that can be completed. Um, and handout three, by the way, is a coaching protocol. So the point of that protocol is for those of you who maybe need um, a little bit more structure or are looking for a little bit more structure to your coaching sessions, um, this coaching protocol can be used to structure that up. And it can also be adjusted, of course, based on the needs of the coaching situation. So um, section A was all about that pre-conference and how you're going to build the alliance. Section B is is all about that observation, whether it's a live observation or whether it's a video or even a, um, a live observation of a virtual classroom. We know that's a reality that might be happening too. And so to structure up that data collection, you might want to um, use section B of that coaching protocol just to look at, okay, what is the teacher doing? What are the students doing? And then we'll talk about the next two columns of that handout. Um, later on, but the idea here is that, you know, in the moment of your observation, you might be thinking about, oh, hey, the teacher's goal is to improve group responses, and this, um, I'm observing a teacher ask a question to an individual student. Do I want to translate that, what I just observed, that data into performance feedback, and you can kind of check very quickly in the moment of, of your observation, yes or no. Now, this is just one example of how to collect data on uh, what you observe in the classroom. So I'm gonna ask um, educators with five plus years of experience, uh, if you could put, um, respond to any of the questions that we have uh, here on this slide in your responses into the chat box. So what data do you collect when coaching? Do you have specific forms that you use that you think would be beneficial for other people on this call to know about? And then even you might highlight um, in your response in the chat box what methods of data collection you use. Like, do you take anecdotal notes? Um, do you do tallies? And kind of unpack what it is that happens for you in the data collection um, part of an observation. Hey Jennifer, this is Steven. Uh, yeah. So if you were switching forward in slides, I don't think they moved forward on, my, on our end. Oh, all right. Let's see. We still see the Alliance Strategies slide. Well, that's no good. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> no. I see uh, They're moving for me, Steven. I don't know oh. about for others, but it may be a Steven issue. Yeah, they're moving for Oh, maybe it's just a Steven issue then. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And so then can I jump in with a question too that uh, somebody Please. posed? So yeah. They, so the, a question was, what if what if what the what they have trained about is not really something that's observable, such as like, hey, they trained about an evaluator doing testing or an art committee or uh, art uh, leader like doing a, 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 a art manager doing an art meeting, like that's not something they can really observe. How would you suggest that they coach about things like that? Well, I'm, is, is the, oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna clarify for you, an art meeting is an IEP meeting. Oh, sorry, Here yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that, because I thought you said art, no. <laughs> A-R-T. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like if they're training them on completing what good IEP paperwork might look like or what a good IEP document might look like, but like you're not going to actually like attend a student's like IEP meeting to see how that was run in real time to observe that or like you can't really observe a school psychologist or a diagnostician evaluating a student using like standardized assessments. 
Yeah, and it kind of sounds like that falls into the category more of a training and trying to build knowledge. Um, I, I think if I'm understanding it, um, where kind of like what's the end goal? Are we looking for a, a change in you know how meetings are run or how a form is completed, or are we looking for a change in teacher practice? with students, I should say. So it's with, I would say, just because I, I know like exactly what Kara is talking about. Um, one of the things I suggested is this might be a good opportunity where you train and then you have some permanent products or some artifacts that you that are then created as a result of that training, right? So if you're looking at the quality of an IEP, you might look at prior to training, what did the IEP quality look like? And then after training, and then you might be coaching around like that permanent product or that artifact is just like an idea I had off the top, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, Jennifer. But it's, it's, it's with evaluation, it's trying to um, improve practice of evaluation staff in the way that they conduct evaluations with students, but you can't really observe those situations because of the standardized nature oftentimes and, um, or, you're coaching around their report writing or the way they put data together. And so it's, it's not something that's happening in real time with students. And I think that's where the challenge is. And Kara, please jump in and correct if I'm not accurately getting at the, the issue that you're speaking to. No, I think, I think you are. I mean, I think you summarized it, it accurately, Deanna, is that staff that we work in in the schools and the in our leas um we don't most of the time directly information and is more of a product like a art work or an evaluation report and so i'm just trying to recount the, the, the coaching model and introducing, putting in that observation and modeling and Yeah, and the audio was a little bit sketchy for me, so I didn't hear everything, so I apologize for that. But I think what I got um, in the explanation is that the coaching um, that that you are thinking about or that we, you know, kind of have on the table is one where it may not be something you could actually observe. And so I think what in, in, you know, it doesn't fit into the way that we're actually talking about coaching right now because it's not possible to conduct an observation of an assessment for a student for an evaluation. Um, so it, it sounds like it's actually kind of a little bit of a different permutation of coaching than what we're talking about. And so that's, that's okay. And so how do you kind of extrapolate out what we're talking about to that particular context? Um, I think then what could you um, what could you do in that pre-conference where you would build alliance? And then if you can't observe the teacher, then, okay, what kind of permanent products? I think I, I saw in the chat box, maybe you could review together in that post-conference and then um, working with that particular um, educator, evaluator, I guess, and providing some performance feedback. So it sounds like, um, maybe it just is a little bit of a different fermentation of coaching than what we're talking about here. And I really like, I don't know if y'all can see Lisa's comment, but I think it's an important one that not only do we have to figure out what we want from them, uh, from the educator, but we also need to make sure the educator knows what the end result is. I don't know, Lisa, if you want to say more about your thoughts around that, but I thought it was a good point. Hi, are you referring to Lisa Rukavina? I am. I didn't even attempt to watch <laughs> No, that's right. totally fine. And I, my, for whatever reason, I can't scroll through the chat to see if there was another Lisa. Um, so just knowing the distinction between coaching for performance and coaching for development in terms of if this is an IEP document, most of what we're doing, there's just a right and wrong. There's once you get it, you got it. But then there's the developmental concept of teaching this educator 
the critical thinking to be able to like incorporate new information. So, so filling out the IEP document versus running the IEP meeting, the parent has concerns that are new and being able to kind of incorporate that and have some sort of like mental framework to take new information in and develop that now into the plan or the program that we're working on. So, so one is just like a what to do kind of coaching and the other one is how do we think and, and having just that framework to build off of. This is the interpreter. We're gonna go ahead and take an opportunity to switch right now. We're good, thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for bringing that, um, Lisa's comment up and then popping over into the phone line, um, Lisa, um, to kind of add in that, the comment about the end goal of, you know, what are we coaching for? And I think you make an excellent point about if we're, you know, when we're looking for those changes in knowledge or completion of something um, like a paperwork, that it, that is different than how to run an IEP meeting. And so maybe when we're going into the um, kind of the landscape of running an IEP meeting, maybe that's where this coaching model fits a little bit more neatly into um, into what it is that um, that could be done by the coach. But when we're doing something like complete paperwork that this particular um, emphasis on a four effective coaching practices may not fit so neatly into into um, that work and uh, sounds like we've got a couple of more comments there in the chat box great point Lisa um, Lisette mentions and then also Deanna there were some um, thank yous in the ch uh, chat box for your idea and um, Stephanie is mentioning using a scenario based modeling for things like this as well all right so I'm going to kind of move us along here and uh, just give a couple of tips about observing and I'm gonna mention here something that I haven't drawn your attention to before but that is uh, well as much before I've, I've mentioned it I've touched on it but I really want to explicitly address this now is that um, you know for these coaching cycles we really can conduct them both face-to-face -face or virtually and expect to see some pretty powerful outcomes um, hand out one one I forgot to mention to you is a, a list of some virtual coaching research. So if this is a world that you're living in and you know that you're going to be conducting virtual research and you want or conducting virtual coaching sessions, take a peek at handout one, which lists out some um, recent studies on virtual coaching. And there's also some practitioner oriented articles in that document as well um, that kind of outlines what virtual coaching can look like so I just wanted to make sure to go back and mention that um, but tips for observing face-to-face -face or virtually are uh, kind of one in the same here um, you know the first two bullets you can read those there I don't need to probably elaborate on it it just gets at the importance of doing what it is that we say that we're going to do and then the third bullet on there um, I think is just something that sometimes we tend to kind of overlook where we're focused so much on um, observing or watching a video of a teacher or being a part of a zoom lesson and only watching the teacher um, we're missing half of the story and teacher practice is not in a vacuum of course there's an end um, result that we're looking for and so whenever we can um, making sure that we can observe both the teachers and the students um, that's something important so that when we do collect data on teacher practice and links to student outcomes we have that data available to us so just something to make sure that you highlight when you're demystifying that coaching process to mention to the teachers that you're going to be supporting all right now I'm gonna pull your attention into the handouts again um, to handout four and it should look uh, similar if not one in the same to what we've got here the graphic that we've got here on this slide with the four quadrants and one of the big uh, questions that comes up a lot is how much is enough and how much is too much and I do want to be clear here that the research is still a little bit of a gray area we don't have the really firm guidelines 
terms of how much is enough and how much to provide to um, individual teachers. But we can start to pull some um, conclusions based on the research that we do have. And one of the kind of takeaways here is that more is not necessarily better. We do not have to allocate extensive amount of time to coaching each individual teacher. We can actually really streamline the amount of time that we allocate to coaching because it turns out that, as I said, more is not necessarily better. So if we want to think about observations happening maybe once a week, um, let me minimize something here. Okay, once a week, at least once a week to every other week, you know, we can think about is that is the frequency and then how long will each of those observations last, you know, less than 20 to 30 minutes or maybe more than 20 to 30 minutes. And so you can kind of place your teachers that you have coached or plan to coach or will coach into one of these quadrants. And the next slide shows some suggestions for how you make those decisions. And it turns out that there are three important factors here. And I'm going to go forward to this slide, but then I will go back to the prior slide in just a second. It turns out that we really need to consider the complexity of the practice. So if a teacher is trying to implement something that is very difficult, there are a lot of moving parts to it, that is something to consider in the dose of coaching. Um, considering the growth, the amount of growth needed from very little to an extensive amount of growth, something for us to think about as we make those decisions. And then the third one there is that teacher's interest in making the change. And I'm going to go back a slide here to that um, to the table that offers those recommendations for where to place uh, teachers into those quadrants. And you can see on the left-hand column, it gives you some scenarios. So for example, in the top row, it's a complex practice. The teacher, or, or I'm sorry, the coachee or the teacher needs to make a lot of growth, but they're interested in making it. And it turns out you have a lot of options. You can place that teacher into quadrant one, two, or even possibly four, and then make adjustments based on how the teacher is progressing. So, um, as I said, this is, you, you have options. It's not black and white. There are those areas of gray, but at least you have some guidelines here into how much might be adequate when it comes to making decisions about dose for observations. So, we are coming up on a, a quick break here and a short activity for you to complete on your own. I want to draw your attention to the yellow um, font on the slide here. Clearly, it is, what, 1030, just in about one or two minutes away. So, we will not return to the session at 1030. We'll probably return at 1040. But on your own, if you could, list out the teachers that you've supported in the past, the ones that you were currently supporting or that you will support in the future and then plot those teachers on the grid based on your existing knowledge of his or her practice and then when we come back we'll do a quick debrief but um, I will stay on the line um, and if you have questions about this task uh, please feel free to put those into the chat box or to ask them over the phone line and then also um, as after you complete the task please feel free to take a short break and I will meet you back here at 1040 and while everybody's getting to take a break, I just want to say something real quick. So I think the network members know about this, but I know the network grantees do for sure. But we created a fidelity of implementation rubric for, for coaching that has, it's kind of a four, um, four level rubric. And so, the, um, so this can go along with the thing that Jennifer, that quadrant thing that Jennifer is showing everybody. So it, on the levels, if you rate somebody like a one or a two on their, on their implementation in the beginning, then that that tells you what quadrant to look at for them. They may need more uh, help with their coaching, but if they rate already rate like a three or four just after the training and they're pretty good, then, then that will tell you maybe they don't need as much coaching. So that rubric that we have created for our coaching fits with what Jennifer is talking about with this quadrant. So I just wanted to point that out. Great. Thanks, Stephen.
have a, a question for clarity. Sure. Uh, the complexity of the task that is determined by the coach or by, in my instance, I'm looking at systems approach or, or is it the complexity that, that the team says, this is, this is going to be complex for our culture and our building? Yeah, great question, Lisette. And um, it is a judgment based on where the individual teacher, or it sounds like you are more of a systems coach, maybe. So, or where the team or school is, you know, how much of a change, how difficult is that from their point of view? You might um, view it as something that's fairly simple or fairly complex, and they could feel the opposite of what, how you would perceive it. So it's more about where they are at and how they judge that um, okay. based on, you know, your, your um, perspective on that. Okay, Great question. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to add, this is Jeanette. I'm going to add to what Lisa asked about a systems coach. And I, I know that we're on break. So, you know, um, so I was working, I've been working with some groups on a certain topic and I recognize that there's a lot of misconceptions about just the framework that they're, that they're supposed to be working on. Um, and I clarified with the group what the difference between a misunderstanding and a misconception, and they totally understand that they are like they have a kind of a broken foundation of understanding of the framework. So having to rebuild that foundation and and undo the layers of misconceptions and then try to go on with the systems coaching, I find that it's really I'm having to backtrack to just align everybody's understanding on the model that they are, that they committed to. Um, and they've been in this role now, I would say easily 10 years for some that they've been functioning under this misconception, you know, this model under misconception. So I'm, we're having to undo that before I can even think about uh, like saying, okay, this is how we move forward. So isn't coaching the same? If, if I'm undoing the misconceptions, am I coaching them through that, right? I mean, it's the same. I'm just asking, putting it out there for whoever's not taking a break. What do you think, Dr. Pierce? Oh, that's a great question. And I, I think you... Um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It sounds like it's a combination of training and coaching kind of at the same time where you're toggling, you know, you've got one foot in, in both of those, uh, in each of those worlds rather, um, to kind of shore up, um, or rebuild new ways of thinking, um, which kind of falls under the umbrella more of like a training, uh, where we're, you know, we're trying to change outcomes with related to knowledge. Uh, but when we're talking about changing behavior, then we might shift over more into that coaching stance where, okay, you know, maybe after we have begin to begun to reconceptualize whatever it is this school or the staff is implementing, okay, now we've got a new frame on it and we understand a little bit better. How do we actually do that? How do we make that change and enact that? that system or whatever it is that's happening there at that school. And that's where, when we provide that support, where we begin to take more of a coaching stance than the training stance. I thank you for clarifying that because I really need to remember when I'm in the training mode and when I'm in the coaching mode and um, that really helps. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely.
resume our call here in about one minute. Shouldn't have taken off my headset. <laughs> now I gotta zhuzh my hair. <laughs> All right, we're gonna make our way back into this session. And if you are out on a break away from your computer, please return to your computer. Hopefully you can still hear me and you've got your headset in and um, got your coffee and your water, able to take a little bit of a stretch break. But let's do a, a quick debrief over that short um, task, activity of plotting your teachers, if you were able to do that, um, why or why not, and then um, what questions or comments do you have about observations? And uh, please feel free to do this over the phone line or the chat box as, uh, as we've done before. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start off because I oh. that's okay. Perfect. Thank you, Twinkle. I want to make sure I understood what we're supposed to do. So it might be more of a question. Great. So when I think, and we may, I'm, several of my colleagues are here. We mainly work with teachers that are students of visual impairments and orientation mobility specialists. So I find myself in a coaching mode in terms of, especially that first year teacher as a VI teacher. So what I do for them is way different than what I do for teachers that are five or plus years. They come across a very unique eye condition with a child. Um, so it's more like it comes brainstorming with the more experienced teachers because we're just trying to resolve what supports that child might need. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, I think what I'm the question was, um, how much is enough support and how do you start to um, draw some parameters around how much time you allocate? Uh, if the goal is to from there to improve, um, improve that practice and the student outcomes, that is that coaching stance or changing behavior we're looking to. How much is enough? for each teacher, knowing that there are some gray areas. And so how do you start to formulate those decisions of how you allocate your, your time? So I'm gonna go back to that grid there and thinking about the, um, the behavior change that is asked of the teacher or the teacher wants to make or maybe doesn't wanna make, that's a factor. Um, the complexity of the practice and the eyes of the coaching recipient or the coachee and their interest in, in making in making that that change. Um, and then based on kind of your insight into that individual teacher, um, drawing some conclusions about would it be one coaching session a week or one coaching session a month? Would it be a 20 minute to 30 minute observation or, um, or would it be something that would require maybe a little bit more time knowing um, from the current line of research that we do not have to spend um, extensive amounts of time with each teacher in order to see changes if our coaching sessions are focused on those four effective coaching practices where we're observing, we're building and maintaining alliance, we're providing performance feedback, and if necessary, we're modeling for that teacher. I, I hope that helped to kind of clarify the task, okay, I see Twinkle's nodding her head, so. Any follow-up questions or, or um, ahas or anything else you'd like to share there, Twinkle? Are we, we good to go? Thumbs up, she says, perfect, love the thumbs up. All right, others, do we have anything in the chat box? Or people over the phone line who'd like to hop in? Well, 
Lizette and I were just talking in the chat box that we really wish that when we were coaching educators that we had had something like this because I think it helps to strike that balance of too much, not enough. Yeah. King of the decision tree, which probably is not technically a tree, but we could, let's just call it that. <laughs> We know what we mean, but I'm happy for your feedback um, because this is actually something that I'm just now putting together and sharing. It's a part of the um, upcoming book that I've got out with Kim St. Martin, um, who's over in Michigan. We um, partnered to put together a coaching book, and so it was one of the graphics that we pulled together for that text. So it's good to have that feedback, and if you have other feedback um, to maybe improve that, please uh, let me know, and then we can kind of improve, improve that document. So it's great to hear that feedback that is helpful. Hey, Jane, All right. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Before you move on, I'm, I'm just I'm getting a lot of questions. So I just want to say it out loud for everybody Please. before you move on. <laughs> so sure. uh, a lot of people are asking if this is a trainer of trainer. And, and so the answer to that is no, we don't expect you all to turn this training around to anybody else. This is just for for us, for TEA and for all of our grantees and ESC network members to be on the same page about what what we expect from coaching and um, and coaching at best practices. So that's why everybody, we're asking everybody to watch the training. If they're not able to be here today, we want everybody to watch it, but you don't have to turn it around. But if you want to use this information, if you if you do feel comfortable training about coaching, you want to use this information, I mean, I think by all means use the information, but we don't expect you to go out and coach or train anybody else on this coaching training. There you go, thank you. Yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Um, and I think that gets at our, the variation that we have in our participants here of this particular session. I know we have network leads, we've got TEA staff, we have other, um, um, you know, my colleagues from AIR, and then we have people who are coaching. Uh, and so hopefully you're starting to kind of uh, make some sense as to what this information means, for, means to you and your role. And please don't hesitate to keep putting those questions into the chat box or coming over to the phone line and um, so that we can make sure to, to clarify things as needed. All right, I am going to, I'm taking a look at the clock and I know that we're running up on the, um, on our lunch break here. So I'm going to actually um, do a little bit of a switcheroo and I'm going to fast forward from modeling and I'm gonna talk about performance feedback. And I am doing that because performance feedback is one of the most complicated coaching practices and one that we're, to if we, um, when we are conducting coaching sessions. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why and providing performance feedback uh, can be difficult and uncomfortable. And so for that reason, given kind of where we are in the, in the clock, I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward from the, from the modeling uh, to get right into, right into that part of our session today because of um, some lunchtime activity. feedback. I want to make sure you're prepared for that, that lunch break and activity. All right. So um, performance feedback is, uh, I already said, one of the most difficult parts of coaching, but it really does distinguish in other forms of supports for teachers. We think about um, maybe some less formal approaches, PLCs, um, that typically does not involve providing performance feedback. Even some peer coaching models shy away from providing performance feedback. But the when we look at um, changing teacher practice, it really is so crucial in using um, and integrating this coaching practice into the coaching sessions. So I'm going to ask you to think fast again, uh, brush off the cobwebs from the module that you watched, and uh, put into the chat box uh, some important features of high quality performance feedback. And I see the answers coming in. You guys are on it. You, you, know, you know what it takes to provide high quality performance feedback. I'm seeing um, in the chat box uh, what is reflected also on the slide that I have showing here. Uh, it is specific. 
and it is linked uh, between teacher practice, student response, or um, or some kind of behavior. And there is a student rationale that is also included in it. And um, what that means is that this isn't about liking a teacher practice and what he or she is doing. It's about the science of teaching. And um, when we offer performance feedback that is specific, not only is it linked, show linkages between teacher practice and student um, responses or behaviors, we say why that linkage is important based on the science of teaching. Um, Performance feedback is timely within 24 hours, ideally. Sometimes it's in the moment. If you're doing something that's called bug and ear coaching, maybe that's something you are familiar with. There's a whole line of research on bug and ear coaching that is absolutely fascinating. Um, but you can provide that in the moment feedback to the teacher. And um, that actually is also very important and a part of that high quality performance feedback. We shy away from corrective feedback, but if it's warranted, it's absolutely critical to share that. But the key is, is that it's always more positive than it is um, negative. And think of it as like our ratio of interactions with students. We try to always be more positive than corrective, and the same goes in uh, coaching. So the goal of a performance feedback is to share, um, constructively share objective data that the teacher can uh, begin to see those linkages between what he or she does and what the student is doing. And in handout, uh, let's see here, let me minimize this screen. It's handout C, or handout three, I'm sorry. In section C, you can find two examples of performance feedback. And these are different than the ones that you um, learned about in the module, but they should follow the general um, structure that was uh, included in that module. What you can see here in handout three, I've got this screenshot up of that handout um, example of positive feedback. It, inc it includes specific and positive statements, each followed by a student rationale, the science of teaching and why it's important. You can see that there are five statements here, all of them having um, a student rationale and being very specific in those linkages between teachers and students and that they are all positive. In handout three, the second example shows some corrective performance feedback. And the way this example is structured is that there are four specific and positive statements that are also linked with rationales. And then at the very end, there is one statement that also has a rationale. Now, this example, um, is meant to just illustrate how you can put your correct your feedback together um, when providing corrective feedback you don't have to have the last statement that you present to the teacher be the corrective statement it can flow in any order that makes sense but the idea is that that feedback and I'm going to go back in my slides here is always kind of adhering to these aspects of um, high quality performance feedback being specific timely corrective and positive all right, so I'm gonna scan for it in our slide deck again. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, and I'm gonna pull this out right now, so make sure that you notice it, is that in this performance feedback, um, in this example, again, is the corrective performance feedback. It is also um, couched with some encouragement and open-ended questions, so that you can see there when you would be uh, providing this performance feedback, you would of course draw on those alliance strategies so that it wouldn't just be about, you know, sharing out this performance feedback, corrective or positive feedback, and then that's it, you're done and you walk away. It's always um, partnered with those alliance strategies. All right, so we're coming up, we've got about six minutes before our lunch break, and I want to make sure to unpack what your task is um, during that lunch break, and, and then also make sure tips. So um, our lunch break, the video clip is about, it is to obviously think about the teacher's goal, which is to increase whole group responding. 
and then use handout three, sections B and C, to construct performance feedback based on that teacher's goal. And then when we come back to lunch at 12.15, we're gonna discuss the performance feedback that you constructed. And then we'll also just talk a little bit about the process that, you know, how did that feel constructing that performance feedback? And we'll also talk about, okay, well now that I've constructed it, how would I go about delivering this in a way that is productive? So that is what your task will be for this next hour and 15 minutes. And we will put the video clip in the chat box here, but I also want to make sure to save some time to make sure that there, if there are questions about what the task is or comments about performance feedback that we get those um, out on the table before we uh, disperse for, for the next 75 minutes. All right, I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to put um, the link to the video into the chat box unless Sarah has already done that. It's about, yeah, she's, I think it's already in there. It's about six and a half minutes um, long, yes. And it's yep. a math lesson, face-to-face -face learning. Oh, the days of face-to-face -face learning. It, it is captured here in this video. Well, now that everyone knows that it's lunchtime, no one wants to ask a question, I understand, but I will stay on um, for the next five minutes or so. And if you have a question, um, please feel free to, to um, ask that. And, um, oh, I see a couple of chats coming in about the handout. We'll make sure to respond to that. And for everyone else, we will see you back here at 1215. All right, have a good lunch break and do your homework. And if y'all want to log off, you can. I mean, we'll, I'll stay logged on, like I'll keep the meeting open. And then that way, when you come back, you'll probably go back to the waiting room and I'll just have to let you back in. But if you want to log off and come back on, that it should work. So We can just mute and stop our video, right? Yeah, you can also do that, whichever one you want to do. But I'm going to pause the recording so there's not like an hour of silence. Yeah, <laughs> good idea. <laughs> My clock, um, and I think we're at about 200 ish people. And I think I saw Stephen there in uh, on the line. Stephen, do we have anyone in the waiting room? People keep popping in, but I just let them in as soon as right. I see them. So you can just okay. you can go ahead and start if you want. Great. All right. I definitely want to start on time and um, honor honor the schedule that we've set. Uh, hopefully you had a wonderful uh, little break there and that you did not just check emails or get on the phone, <laughs> that you actually took um, a break and had some lunch or a stroll, whatever it was that um, you could do to kind of decompress here from the nonstop Zoom meetings that I know we live by these days. All right, so um, we're gonna get right back into it here. It just dive right in to that performance feedback. And um, if you have a spring birthday, March, April, May, I'm gonna ask for you to put into the chat box some of your um, reactions to that. Process of constructing uh, performance feedback. What was easy for you? Why? Maybe what was a challenge and why? You don't have to respond to all of these questions. You can pick the one that you'd like, or you could respond to all of them, completely up to you. And then I'm curious to hear also how this process might be different from what you done in the past. So all of our spring uh, birthday uh, folks out there, pop those responses into the chat box, please. I know someone has to be a spring baby on the line out of 200 people <laughs> and we'll never know if you're not. 
<laughs> be the brave soul and pop that information in there for us, uh, if you don't mind. And while we're waiting for people to do that, I'm actually gonna also just open up the phone lines. Um, love to hear your voices and uh, share any of your reactions to, um, to the process of constructing feedback, uh, performance feedback, questions or comments, or you could even uh, provide uh, any of your, um, over the phone line, any of your experiences with, with what that uh, process was like. Hi, my name is Claudia Vargas. I, okay. Did you say you opened the line? I sure did. Thank you for bringing the brave soul to pop into that uh, into that space. Thank you. Go ahead. So, um, I was I am the family engagement consultant at ESC Region Twenty, but I used to be a bilingual ESL consultant, and do the and I would work with teachers. My first thing was language development, right? So I couldn't help but notice the first thing my brain went to, oh, let's do a, you know, a sentence stem, a, a think, write, share, you know, turn to a partner, take turns. There wasn't enough interaction for everyone to be using that academic language. So my brain just started going to there. And earlier you had asked about which rubrics we used and you know, um, I, we would do qualitative data, but we also did the, we would check off, you know, how much of the engagement, were there, uh, did they repeat the content and language objectives, you know, did they review it at the beginning, at the end, little things like that, that go with the training of sheltered instruction. So those are look for us. In terms of the EL world, I'm not sure which <laughs> world we're looking at. I know it was math, but in terms of language development too. Yeah, great, great comments there and feedback, um, <laughs> feedback on, on what you noticed in, in that lesson and your mind automatically went to your area of expertise, which was in fact linked to the teacher's goal area. So um, you might recall that um, the, in this scenario, the teacher's goal was to improve whole group responses and you just kind of rattled off right away some opportunities, different ways for that teacher to engage more students in that six and a half half minute lesson rather than relying on individual turns. So thanks for noticing that and um, offering up some of those ideas. So the let me pose another question to, to everyone here about the process of putting together structured performance feedback in this way. And I'm gonna um, shift slides here forward to an example of corrective feedback. It's a lot to read on a slide, so I can't, I'll go kind of like step-by-step step through this. Um, if you were constructing sample performance feedback, an example of performance feedback for this teacher, how could you do that in a way where it is specific, meaning that it is linked to what the teacher does and what the students do. And um, it has a student rationale, like that science of teaching. Um, how can you put that together? And so this is just one example where you draw out in that six minute lesson, the teacher asked eight questions and eight students responded correctly. Now I made up that eight number, I actually didn't go in and count, know exactly how many individual turns were given to that um, to that to the class and how many individual students responded and how many of those responses were correct and why that's important because we don't want to diminish what happened in the lesson the, we are looking for the positives in the lesson before we even get to that corrective feedback and so then you might come up with three more positive statements for example, about the pacing of the lesson, the classroom climate, other things that you noticed, um, maybe based on your area of expertise. And then a statement about what um, could maybe uh, 
progress for that teacher based on the idea that his or her goal was to improve whole group responses. So there's a statement about um, the fact that that didn't happen and why it's important, kind of getting again at the science of teaching. The next bullet here is about that teacher's goal and a little bit of encouragement, that open-ended question, that alliance building strategy of how could you adjust the lesson next time to include whole group response options. And finally, after the teacher responds, uh, encouragement and um, champion, championing his, um, her efforts to give those uh, ideas a try. So I have a question before you move on. Perfect, I love it. This whole time is we've got about 10 minutes even to dedicate to conversation about this. So, so um, I definitely welcome your comments and feedback about this. Okay. So um, again, and, and uh, we talked about it earlier where we kind of tend to go to our background and so special education. And so one of the things I would want to ask and I'm trying to think what would be a way to reform it because in the lesson, um, I didn't see or wasn't sure if there are any students that needed any kind of accommodations. You know, so if that was the lesson, you know, what would be a more corrective feedback to bring up that topic to find out? And again, it's, I know it's six minutes, but you know, when she called on students and Roy or Zyra, I forgot which, the little girl off to the left or my right, um, I think she answered twice. So I didn't see some students answering. So I'd be curious as to what would be a good suggestion about how do you bring that part up, you know, so you can inquire if there are any students that might need accommodations. I'm going to, of course, put this out to the whole group to see if uh, any of the people here on the phone line, any of you have ideas about that before I jump in to respond, um, acknowledging your uh, insight and expertise in, in this particular area. Anyone want to respond to the, the question that came up? I can, if you'd like. Great, thank you. I'm Gabriel Verone. I'm from Region 11. I was an in-class uh, instructional coach uh, going to different campuses. Now I'm doing ESL bilingual. Uh, but Twinkle, what I would say and what I've done is now I think if you're there in person, you can actually gather more data. So I would try to find something that maybe is an accommodation. Say, I noticed this. It looked like an accommodation. Was that in fact an accommodation? And then I would simply ask, what are some accommodations that you provided that maybe I failed to notice? Because then the, uh, the onus is on you. It wasn't that the teacher didn't do it. You just, I'm so sorry, I didn't notice it. And then the teacher might say, oh, well, there weren't any. And then simply follow up, well, what are some that you're aware of? What are some you have used in the past? What are some that you have found to be effective? And eventually, um, people will either answer or they'll get to the place where they're like, you know what, I don't know. You're the coach. Why don't you just tell me? So you don't want to inundate them with questions, but I would say, um, like she said, affirm the positive, provide whatever data you're able to, and then ask open-ended questions to kind of feel out that situation. That's how I've done it. That seems to have worked okay in the past. Others want to weigh in on this, or thanks for that thumbs up there and that uh, offering up some insight there, Gabriel. That's very helpful. Others want to chime in? And I think what I have heard there in not just the question, but in the response was that um, getting at what happens during the pre-conference because this the delivery of the performance feedback would not just happen in a vacuum. You would have already set the stage um, for providing that performance feedback feedback by conducting that, um, that pre-conference where you get together with the teacher and not only establish demystifying what coaching looks like, what the teacher can expect the coach to do, and coming to agreement about um, what will happen in a coaching session, including how the teacher will teacher will receive performance feedback like is it graphs is it verbal comments is it you know is it something else that he or she would be able to uh, receive from you and would prefer to receive um, coming to agreement on that but all of these conversations 
and what is happening in the classroom and what is of interest to the teacher would have kind of come out and to the surface during that free conference so that if you are coaching um, a teacher let's say a general education teacher in something more about the, um, that falls under the umbrella of special education and, and supporting students with disabilities, then you would kind of be able to frame out that the conversation in that pre in the pre conference, so that you could get a little bit of an understanding of what does it look like for that particular teacher to support students with disabilities in his or her classroom. And then of course, linking in the performance feedback based on your observation to um, whatever topic it is that you guys have, have discussed in that free conference. All right, and uh, continuing on with providing that performance feedback, obviously when you are in the observation, you're going to be collecting data in the requested area. And then when it comes to providing the performance feedback, it really is an intentional process. So even before you conduct your post-conference with that teacher, take the time to structure up your performance feedback. It's not something that, um, is really kind of an off the cuff activity unless we are just really good and proficient and we have the expert experience in providing uh, high quality performance feedback. It can feel a little awkward if we don't structure up before we have that post conference and even sometimes rehearsing the delivery of it so it doesn't seem so stale or um, kind of robotic. We want this to be a conversation um, and maybe taking the time to practice that and structure it up can go a long way in how the teacher receives it and our comfort level in providing that performance feedback. And then as you um, can see in your handout, that same handout, uh, handout three, in the post-conference, you would begin um, not by just issuing off all of what you your performance feedback you would start off instead with those open-ended questions where you could ask something like how did that lesson go and I think Gabriel alluded to this also in his response is that you're using those alliance strategies and then flowing into that performance feedback instead of abruptly beginning it now with the caveat that every teacher is going to be a little bit different and the coaching situations are going to be different. You might have teachers who just want to cut to the chase and get right to that performance feedback and the relationship that you have, the alliance is strong enough between you and the coaching uh, recipient where it's perfectly adequate for you guys to go ahead and do that. So uh, think about those nuances and know that it's not lockstep, but a general rule of thumb is to, to start off with those open-ended questions. And then I think I've already mentioned this, but I, I, it's worth mentioning is that, um, you know, performance feedback is not about your preferences uh, of instruction. I like um, when A, B, and C. I like when X, Y, and Z. Rather, it is about making explicit those links between what the teacher does and what the students do and why that is so important based on the science of teaching um, and not your individual preferences um, and and which can sound, make coaching too subjective, but more objective in the nature of what we're talking about in, as, um, as we conduct these coaching sessions. Hey, Jennifer. Yeah, Sarah. Um, a couple of people have questions for you on performance feedback. Is now a good time Great. for them? Or do you Wonderful. Want to I love it. Let's have it. So Susan Brown, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes. Yeah, so um, I didn't... Um, like typically in that situation, I would fall on the expertise piece. And um, so I did like a three, two, one where like they thought about it for 30 seconds and then they talked to a partner for 30 seconds. And then, and then I asked the class so that, you know, kind of everybody was participating. But if I, I don't know how that's, but that's falling on the expertise and I think that's what we're supposed to stay away from. So how would I build that into this model without just saying, just try this? Um, would maybe tallying um, 
how many students raised their hands and how many students, you know, just kind of stared at the carpet because they didn't, you know, they didn't want to be called on kind of thing? Yeah, you, this is a great question. And I think you get um, at two important areas, which is during the observation, um, in order to construct your performance feedback, you are collecting data in some of the ways that you mentioned seem perfectly um, appropriate it, to get at how are students responding? How are how is the teacher asking questions of the students? What is that? What does that look like? Let's unpack it. And you identified a couple of ways to unpack and tell the story of what was happening in that classroom doing that telling that story through the data collection process so absolutely yes and then I think the second part which is what you started off with um, was well how do I communicate this like if, if the teacher after I give this this perform provide this performance feedback and you know I've set the stage by asking the teacher open-ended questions and then I share that performance feedback what do I do next do and relying on your expertise is very important um, I think it's that balance of honoring the, the wisdom of the um, teacher with your expertise and so it wouldn't hurt to ask a question of that teacher how would you how do you make sense of this data based on your goal of increasing whole group responses what are your ideas for how to make some adjustments so that you can make progress toward your goal and if the teacher maybe kind of stumbles or isn't able to to brainstorm some ideas with you please absolutely you draw on that expertise that you have and bring it to the table so that um, he or she isn't kind of left uh, at the end of the coaching session not knowing what to do and having a clear plan uh, for how to how to move forward towards that goal. Wonderful question. Thank you, Susan. And then Jennifer, we had one more from Daniel. Daniel, do you want to ask your question? Daniel, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Yeah, I'm looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Daniel, there you are. Daniel Rigney, do you want to ask your question about performance feedback? Oh, okay. I can read your lips. It says you're trying to talk. Things aren't working. Okay, we'll come back to you, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, we don't, just, we don't want I'm sorry, I was just saying you can just put it in a chat too and we can read it out loud if you want, Daniel. Yeah, perfect. Okay, Jennifer, I think that's it for right now. Uh, and then when Daniel's question comes through, do you want us just to stop you again? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Because what I'm going to do now is hopefully this isn't dr um, driving all of us linear folks like completely bananas, but I'm going to go back in the slide deck to the modeling section because we didn't, um, we skipped over that so that we could make sure to get to the performance feedback um, section of the, of the day. Uh, so just bear with me here as I, as I uh, go backwards in our slide deck because there's just a couple of things that I want to make sure to mention um, just so that we can dedicate, you know, time explicitly to talking about all four of the effective coaching practices. So at this point, we've talked about alliance strategies, we've talked about performance feedback, and we've talked about observations. And so the remaining one is modeling, which is akin to um, what we actually do with students a lot of time. Showing the, instead of showing the students how to do something, it's showing the teacher in this case how to implement or use a program practice or, or some kind of um, skill or um, uh, strategy. Now the kicker here is that we don't have to model for every teacher and not every coaching session needs to contain modeling or demonstration. Really the goal here is to use this to support the correct use of whatever practice the teacher is trying to implement or is implementing and when it's needed. So if the teacher is making teaching errors or not sure what to do, this is the time for modeling. Um, and like all of the other coaching practices, we have demystified when we would model and what that would look like. 
and that we would be flexible in our use of those uh, of modeling approaches. So this is a little bit different. This is new and not included in the module, and so I wanted to make sure to, to highlight this here, is that there are different ways of modeling, and we can kind of pick the one that makes the most sense based on what the teacher needs. And these are structured in a most to least intensive um, flow. So doing a live as when you are in a classroom face to face with a teacher conducting a live model that is I do, we do, you do, that feels pretty intensive to the teacher. And sometimes it is welcomed and sometimes it's important for us to do that. And again, you would have laid out when this would happen with the teacher and talk to the teacher that this might be something that, that happens. And um, getting a sense of his or her comfort level with this and if this is something that just doesn't feel feel comfortable for the teacher then I would say don't do it and go to a, a less intensive type of modeling approach that still gives the teacher the opportunity to see the practice in action and to see what it looks like and what it feels like to use that practice correctly so on the slide I've got listed a couple of other options there's that I do you do so it skips that middle section and this is also assuming that this would be happening live face-to-face -face in a classroom setting but with that said this could be done virtually if you are observing a zoom lesson and you are remote the teacher is remote the students are remote you could step in if the teacher and you have talked about this and come to an agreement that this might happen you might step in and do a part of the lesson or teach a little skill subset of a skill and then and have the teacher kind of replicate what you just did. So it is possible to put this into a virtual format. Um, and then there's some, a couple of other options that are less intensive um, than that I do, we do, you do, and the I do, you do approach that are listed here. You might just simply provide video examples. Um, maybe the lesson that you observed for the performance feedback, maybe that actually does capture something that is important that for the teacher to know how to do. And that it could be an example of, of sharing a lesson that's already pre-recorded um, with a teacher so that he or she could see that see that and if you have the luxury of working face-to-face -face, going to another classroom of someone who is implementing the same practice or program skill or strategy where you could watch with alongside the teacher or maybe that teacher just observes that lesson by himself or herself um, as that teacher So the idea here is that you have options and the options are based on what is needed by the teacher and what the teacher is receptive to and knowing that you can probably shift your use of these approaches based on the dynamic or the alliance that you have with the teacher and the needs and so you know don't it, you won't say fixed in one particular way and expect that it might shift excuse me this is the interpreter could we pause for a moment to change interpreters sure thank you so much We got it. Thank you so much. Great. No problem. All right. So let's take just a couple of moments for um, unpacking anything about modeling. That was a very, very fast um, overview of modeling and a couple of tips. So I want to make sure that if you have questions from the module about modeling or something that you've experienced in your own practice or the idea of modeling, that we get that, those out on the table. Please feel free um, to post those in the chat or over the phone line now. Um, and we will take the time to address them now. Um, we won't have to wait until the end of the session to do that. Hi, this is Claudia from Region 20. Hi, Claudia. It's just easier for me to talk than talk. Yeah, yay, go for it. As I was listening, I kept thinking, um, we sometimes would get teachers ask us, ask us to model a lesson. 
which I'm all for it. Like, oh yeah, let's do it. But it, it just depends on which consultant we're working with and the reluctance of the consultant. And I've heard them say, no, because it gives them a, a way out. Sometimes when they've experienced modeling, uh, the teacher goes and does something else, grading papers, like they take advantage of the time there. So as I'm trying to kind of um, consolidate my thinking here, I'm thinking, oh, it would be much better then as we continue to grow as well, maybe offering to model a specific strategy during the lesson, right? Instead of modeling the whole lesson. So let me show you how I would do a structured conversation using this topic, right? And if you're comfortable with it versus the whole 45 minutes or whatever. Just wanted to throw that out in terms of experiences that we've had with modeling. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Claudia. Um, I, I wonder if others have had that experience as well. Um, I know, I think I saw some heads shaking as I was scanning through, scanning through the images on, on the video here. And yeah, um, I think that's a great idea to kind of reframe what modeling looks like from a whole lesson to a part of a lesson. And you're demystifying, again, the expectation of what happens during modeling. It is not about the teacher um, taking a passive role. It really is an active uh, interaction and learning opportunity that happens as a part of coaching. So making clear if if maybe that's a shift from what teachers have experienced in the past, you know, it would be important to communicate that shift and, and what it looked like in the past and the direction that we're going now and why. And, um, you know, making sure to have that conversation and, and clarifying um, and the why, why it's important for, um, for modeling to be maybe a shorter snippet of a precise um, aspect of instruction rather than an entire lesson um, absolutely other other comments like that was fantastic thank you for sharing that other experiences with modeling um, or demonstration or tips that you that you could provide to, to others on the line I have, I have um, an example when you're building rapport with the teacher and you have a discussion about what the coaching process is going to look like and in the discussion, um, the teacher expresses due to um, external factors such as the administrator looking in as I, as the coach, am picking up uh, modeling part of the instruction that it gives um, a unwanted perception. So uh, the teacher may feel like the principal really feels like she has no control or she really does not have any expertise whatsoever. So the teacher may request, can I watch videos um, in you these practices and then I can turn on myself maybe the next day or at some point. So some teachers just don't like you to come into their classroom and work with their kids. Um, and you know it's territorial in many instances and so um, I've used the option of uh, video modeling so that the teacher has access to the to the same experience Oh, Lizette, thank you so much for sharing that. If you were looking at my camera, I was like a bobblehead, just nodding away at, at what you were saying. And the same when, when Claudia was speaking, um, because you, you touch on a couple of, of really important points here, is the trust between the teacher and the coach, and the teacher and the administrator, and the coach and the administrator. Any of these coaching practices, um, taking into consideration how coaching might be viewed, um, not just between us and the teacher, but between the principal or the, the leader and the person being coached. And I think that's an important point to make, um, which then um, leads to the idea of it's not just important for us to demystify what coaching looks like and why with teachers. It's really important for us to demystify for leaders what we will be doing with teachers and why. And that um, the, the purpose of coaching is, yes, improve teaching and student outcomes, but it's not about the uh, coach being the reporter going directly to the administrator to share out 
um, this is what I observed and to give specific information. And um, this is another part of that coaching conversation of demystifying what coaching will look like. And, you know, I really should have had a bulleted point in here because this is very important about keeping what is confidential and what is not confidential in the data that will be collected and in the conversations that will transpire uh, between the teacher and the coach. And so I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something else for us to consider with conducting these coaching sessions is to really make clear um, what we will be discussing with others outside of that dyad, that coach teacher dyad, and what will remain confidential um, there. And that might be different based on your situation and that's okay. It's more about clarifying all of that and having those conversations. These are great comments. Um, anyone else want to give their experiences, uh, hints about uh, coaching for uh, practices that we've talked about thus far? And, and that would include all four of them, observing, modeling, alliance strategies, and performance feedback. Jennifer, I will share. This is Shelly from Region 4. Hi, and Shelly. Modeling, hi. Modeling really shifted for me when we got very clear about what are we modeling. Because some of the coaches that I work with, what they were modeling was a lesson and the teacher didn't know what they were supposed to focus on. So either they checked out and they started doing the other things that are on their list or they tried to do everything. And so when we said, I want you to model how to do a structured conversation and they had a checklist. So we said, what do you really need to take forward with you so that it changes your practice? And so building that checklist, which we you know, anchored to Jim Knight, Building that checklist really helped to where we could see teachers. And then when we did the follow-up observation and we did the performance feedback, we anchored back to that checklist that we built together. And so when you talk about getting buy-in, that for me was a pivotal change in my practice with modeling. Uh, Shelley, thanks for, for sharing that. Um, and see, these, these are experiences that we have that we figure it out in, on the job a lot of times. And so it's so helpful to hear about your experiences because we do, as coaches, um, have um, that void of not being able, not the, having the luxury of entering the job with a preparation program under our belt. So having these, these stories and sharing our experiences really helps to kind of shore up our foundation of coaching skills. All right, I am going to fast forward in the slide deck uh, back to where we left off. And this is going to be a little bit of a shift now that we finished um, talking about all four of those effective coaching strategies. We're going to talk a little bit more now about the context of coaching in your area. And one of the things that, um, that TEA staff felt was really important was to consider and to have conversations about making time for coaching. And if you think back to one of those key coaching challenges that I mentioned at just about 9 or 9.30 in the morning, it was making time for coaching because the job role is so extensive. And oftentimes, coaching is that add-on job responsibility, that tack-on job, and maybe some of you are in that position. So so how do we make time to conduct these um, coaching cycles that consist of the four effective practices and have pre-conferences, observations, and post-conferences? How do we make time for that? And um, some considerations for, for making that work. Um, are listed on, on this slide. And this is just to kind of acknowledge the context that either you are in as a coach, or if you are a network lead, maybe some of your coaches will, will face, these, um, face some of these situations where they feel more comfortable in a training role than a coaching role. Maybe, um, 
they are more comfortable using another model of coaching or approach of coaching than in the way that we've talked about coaching today. And then, of course, there's always COVID. That is um, something for us to consider in today's climate. So these are all factors that will come into play in how we allocate time for coaching. And so it was important for us to communicate today on this, um, on this session that the idea is to get started and that we are not expecting progress. Um, we are, uh, or I'm sorry, we're not expecting perfection. We're expecting progress. And it's all about quality over quantity. And this ties to the research that I shared to you, that meta-analysis from Kraft and colleagues back in 2018, just a few years ago, where they found that it wasn't so much how much coaching was happening, but the quality of the coaching. And so this is why it's important for us to get our feet wet and to begin coaching, um, even when it might be a little bit of a different um, uh, approach task or, or role in our job. So I'm going to ask um, those of you on the line here who are coaches, um, who will be working with teachers to identify one to three ways that you can streamline um, your existing work so that you can allocate time towards coaching. And if you are a network lead or maybe you are not going to be in that coaching role, I'd like for you to similarly think about how you can help coaches streamline? What can you do to help streamline their job so that they can allocate time towards coaching? I'm going to ask that you just take a few moments to think about this. And if you need to take a quick break, we're going to go ahead and have that sanction that into our time here. So it, I have that it is almost one o'clock. We've got about seven minutes or so until then. So between now and one o'clock, post one way that you're going to stream streamline your work or as a network lead, how you're going to help coaches streamline their work. And uh, if you need to take that post-lunch break, you know, we all have that dip so after lunch. So please feel free to um, turn off your camera, step away for a few moments, but post what you, your ideas are into the chat box by uh, one o'clock, please. And, and we'll see you here in a few moments. So I have that it is right on the nose of one o'clock. So let's hear some of the um, chats. I actually am not able to pull up all of the chats. If maybe Sarah or Stephen or Deanna could pull through some of those and um, let's get some of those out here so we can hear uh, what folks had to say. So I think when I'm going through it, a lot of people had the same idea of creating doable schedules, which I think is uh, not just creating a schedule, but creating a doable schedule um, and prioritizing time to actually coach. Um, a lot of people mentioned having that kind of sacred time that we know that coaching um, can have such a big shift in, in teacher practices as well as student achievement. So having that set aside and make it sacred. Um, I'm looking through some of them, but I'm trying to pull out some of the big points. Great, that's, that's helpful. A lot of people also mentioned, sorry, because I'm obsessed with that uh, decision tree. A lot of people did mention that, you know, they would try to use that to also um, schedule. So when they're meeting with educators, you know, uh, understanding which educators or which groups of educators are going to need more versus which maybe are going to need less and, and kind of factoring in those complexity of what they're coaching around as well. Great. Great. Oh, no, that's very helpful, Sarah. Thanks for sharing out those comments. And thanks to all of you to put in those comments in the chat box. And I want to be sure here to mention one other thing that um, Sarah and Deanna and Stephen and I talked about prior to today's session, and that is utilizing the existing tools and resources that you have already created um, so that we are not relying on ourselves to uh, a lot of different resources, training materials, PowerPoints, handouts, um, guides that you and your colleagues have developed. So drawing on those instead of recreating them can um, help us kind of streamline our work. And that was something that I thought was really interesting um, for, uh, for coaches in the Texas context. To, to think about and remember that we have a lot of materials at our fingertips and let's use them so that we can springboard into that coaching stance. 
All right, so we are into the final hour of our session today. Thank you for hanging with me here. We're still up in the high 200 or in the 200s for participants, so I really appreciate your engagement in this full day session. And we got a couple of more conversation points before we wrap up today. And one of those is a video about virtual coaching. So stay tuned for that. That'll be in about um, 15 minutes or so. We will kick into that. But before we do that, I just want to. Um, talk about fidelity of coaching. And if you're looking at the TEA one pager, the coaching handout, that which is handout uh, two, um, you will see that um, data collection is in that bottom portion of that document. And um, I, before we pull up that document, let's just kind of make sure that we're all on the same page here with what we're talking about um, for fidelity data. Um, we tend to think about fidelity data as teachers' fidelity of practice, but here what we're talking about is the coach fidelity of practice. So if we expect coaches to conduct um, cycles of observing, providing performance feedback, modeling, and using alliance strategies, then those are the practices that we want to collect data on to better understand what is happening. And that's what we mean when we talk about fidelity of coaching. And the purpose of this, as with any other type of fidelity data, whether it's for the teacher or the coach, is to understand what coaching looks like and to support um, that continuous improvement and the refinement and um, honing of your skills as a coach. Um, just a quick um, unpacking a little bit more of what fidelity um, means and the different aspects of, of fidelity. We often think of fidelity as adherence, where we have a checklist and we go in and we look for item A, B, C, and D on our checklist. And uh, that is one aspect of fidelity that is important. We want to know that those for effective practices are being used by coaches, and there is adherence to those coaching practices. But it's not just about adherence to coaching practices. The dose of coaching is important, and that is an aspect of fidelity. The quality of the coach's use of those four effective practices is important. That is another aspect of fidelity. And finally, the participant responsiveness or the engagement of the teacher in that coaching session, that's a fourth aspect of fidelity. Um, that's important. Now, we are starting slow with collecting fidelity data of coaching practice. We're going to look at two areas um, first, adherence and dose, and you will see that reflected in that one-page handout. Here's a little screenshot of that there. On the bottom section of, um, of that handout, you can see some information listed about coaching data. So, um, let me flip back here to this slide, and then we'll we'll come back to to that handout. Um, what are you? What can you expect if you are a coach? And knowing that um, we're interested in collecting some coaching data, what is it that you can expect to transpire to support that data collection? Um, coaches will complete a fidelity implementation survey after conducting a coaching cycle, and then we'll have quarterly conversations about that data within each network. And then the idea is for, um, for there to be opportunities to share from that data what coaches need to continuously refine their, their skills. So if you could read over the data that um, will be submitted um, as a part of, of, the, um, of your coaching sessions, and then let's make sure that we clarify the, any questions that you have about that, what um, you know what that process looks like so that things are really clear uh, about coaching data. And I have here in the chat box, but let's not, not limit ourselves. I think we heard some really great um, stories from some of you who are on the line. So please feel free to, if, um, to hop in over the phone line or to post those in the chat. Either way will work out just great here.
and I'm not able to see the chat box. How do, do we have anything coming into the chat box there? People are uh, still reading and uh, and kind of formulating their questions. Great. Give us a couple more seconds. Absolutely. It seems like TEA laid that out pretty clear and there are no questions right now. So uh, still nothing uh, nothing in the chat box. All right. Oh, well, I'm a Twinkle. Hold on, Twinkle just put something in there. We can always count on her. Uh, she would like a bit more collaboration on the coaching data. So will they have a form to uh, fill out? Um, and then one more question that could be for TEA. So Stephen and Deanna, maybe that is a better question for you guys to answer. And then another one that looks like maybe it would still be for Stephen and Deanna. Will we still record this coaching as technical assistance in AALRP or will we only record it with the network? So. So as far as the uh, coaching, the implementation, that was the, um, the, Fidelity of implementation tool that I referenced earlier. So all the network grantees, the leads of the network, have access to our Qualtrics, TEA's Qualtrics account, and that's where that form lives. And so what they'll do is, is it's already decided which trainings the networks will provide coaching on for this year. And so the, the network grantees, the leads, will go into the, that Qualtrics account and create a Fidelity of implementation form based on that training. Like what were the skills from that training that that y'all were teaching, that y'all should have been training about uh, the network members. And uh, so they'll send that form out, it, it'll just be a link. So then when you go and do your observations of the teacher, you'll you'll have that form already created for you. So you can fill it out uh, before your observation, then after each uh, coaching cycle. So that's where that form will come, come from. Um, and I'm gonna sound really stupid here. I don't know what AALRP stands for. <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know hey, Steven, before we get that, can I just add to something that one of the things there might be a few networks like remember we have nine technical assistance networks. So every single network may not have a training that they're coaching on this year because we have some networks in different places in terms of development of a training that's not already turnaround training that they can be coaching on. So um, just to say like there's it's possible that your network may not have a specific training that you're coaching around, but we still want everyone to be like part of this learning together and moving forward. So if you don't, if you're unclear about if there's a training that your network's coaching on and you're a network member, that's a good conversation to have with your lead as a network about what specifically you guys are doing in your network. Yep. I and I don't know what that stands for either. A lot of people are saying they don't know what that stands for. So Susan, do you want to um, maybe, uh, oh, accountability. This doesn't get you out of doing any other submission of data for any other project at TEA is what I would say about that. <laughs> yeah. And so, so if you're submitting information about coaching for another project or something else that you would still continue to, to do that. Yeah, yeah. So what I would say is, it's great if you want to use these techniques for all the things you're coaching on. We know you don't just coach on network activities, but for our purposes specifically, uh, is what we're talking about is around the networks. Is is like what Deanna said. A lot of the networks do have things they're coaching on. Some may, some may not. Some may have more than others. But those are the things where we want to collect data on. So any other data collection that that y'all have, then that yeah, that's on. That that you still need to do that. But we're just wanting to collect the data on the trainings from the network that you all are, are specifically coaching on. So um, a, a question for clarification. It's my understanding that each ESC submits to TEA the, tech, the amount of technical assistance that has been provided, you know, over the course of the year, right? So will there now be a new domain titled coaching 
or will we put coaching under the technical assistance? Um, I'm going to attempt to answer this question, but uh, if I give the wrong answer, then we can follow up to make sure. But what I would say is, is you would probably, if, if you're talking about things you have to include in like your, your CSIP for like a, a, the, the ESC, then I would just include this under technical assistance. And so again, this is kind of a, just a specific for these specific trainings that the networks are going to provide coaching for. We're collecting data on, on that stuff. So any, all the other things that you would normally report under that coaching or technical assistance, I would still report it there. This is just specifically for these trainings that we're, that we're uh, involved with. Deanna, you want to add anything to that? I think you're, I think the ESC, the, the network leads are going to be getting us this data. So there might be different ways that they gather that from the network members to feed it up to give us some information about network trainings and coaching. Um, but yeah, Stephen, I think what you said sounds, I mean, I know you guys report at the ESC. And we can talk with Jennifer Patterson just a little bit to see, you know, if there's a specific place that your coaching connected to the networks needs to go on those reports and share that back out. And so Lisa's question, will each network send out the survey for the coaching data? Yes, the coaching, the, the grantee, the lead of the network should have their own, a Qualtrics, or somebody in the network, at least two people have uh, Qualtrics accounts. And so those, those people, and they should know who they are, will be responsible for creating those forms to send out to the network members to use when, they, when they're doing their coaching over those trainings. And so, and then the next question there says, will all the teachers that attend the network trainings receive coaching or they opt in? No, they, all of them will not receive training because some of y'all's trainings may be like a hundred people. You know, we don't expect you to go out and train a hundred or coach a hundred people. So no, most networks that do have a training component in there also have some kind of a, a, a thing like 10% will be coached or some percentage will be coached or some number will be coached. So no, all teachers don't have to be uh, coached that are trained it would be some percentage of that. And it, I guess it's just up to each network how, how you'll, you'll decide who will opt in who, and, or not. You can ask for volunteers. It can be, I don't know if you're gonna do it randomly based on who attends the trainings, but especially since this is the first year, maybe a lot of, a lot of these trainings are getting coached on or, or we're doing this, this practice a little more. It, I think it's always better to, to ask for volunteers or to have some kind of opt in, because that's gonna be your easiest way to get willing participants instead of those participants y'all are y'all were mentioning earlier that may not be as willing to engage in the coaching. As Jennifer mentioned earlier, this is about quality over quantity. So please don't think that by us wanting to start getting a handle on the numbers and the data around what's happening, how many people are being trained, how many people are being coached. It's really just so we can get some baseline, some idea of what's happening and get us started down the road of coaching because we know that training alone doesn't impact practice and impact student outcomes in the way that coaching does. And so we really want to start moving more in that direction, but we're really looking for quality over quantity. So don't feel like, oh, I'm a representative from region 21 and I need to just coach tons and tons of teachers to show, show the network and show TEA like how good I am. Like it's not about the number that you coach. It's really about taking that training from the network and being that bridge to implementation and doing a bang up job with the number of teachers that you can to get them doing better practices that make better outcomes for the kids in their classroom. And thank you to the network leads here in the chat are kind of clarifying for their different networks about like what their plan is for getting this form out to the network members. So uh, I see I see network one and network 10 and probably some others in there that have kind of clarified the more discussions about this to come. <clears throat> And like always, Stephen and I are figuring it out as we go. So we figure the first step is to start doing something instead of just hanging around talking about coaching and how important it is. We're going to take some active steps towards making it better and we'll get better and we'll iterate and we'll figure it out um, as we go. We're always building the plane as we fly. You know, that's kind of the way we do it. I don't think Deanna means that. We know exactly what we're doing and trust everything we say. <laughs> no. Hi everyone, this is Jeanette from Region 1. I, I know that the MTSS 
um, the tier network is going to be selecting some pilot schools for that for that initiative. And I was wondering if maybe those might be the schools that would be fertile ground, if you will, for for support. Uh, you know, layering on the support to those campuses that are already expressing active interest in MTSS of implementation um, to kind of maybe uh, piggyback on the on that. What what are your thoughts? Hi, this is Janice from Tier, and thank you for bringing that up. That is definitely something that we would like to include. So there will be a coaching component for that. Great. So it looks like Susan has a question. If Stephen or Deanna, you guys could help answer that in the chat box so that we can continue on uh, with our presentation uh, with Jennifer, if that's okay. Yeah, Stephen, I, I had was typing a response, so I'll go ahead and start and then you can tell me what I said was if it was wrong. So okay. what you were going to say. So um, if the network has a goal to coach 10%, then I would say that that is a goal statewide for the network. And so an individual person may not be able to hit 10% in their region, but somebody else may be able to hit a big, so that the total that you're shooting for working collaboratively as a network, trying to get that 10% and like helping each other out with maybe who can pick up some more and who, you know, can't, that that would be a good way to think about it is hitting that those percentages as a as a whole network. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, we're looking for our same thing from the grantees from the leads. If if we aim to get 10% and this year we get 5% and we get quality, then that's going to be good. And we're going to talk about how do we progress and what can we do differently to get more teachers coached the following year? Like what can we do at TEA? What can we do as a network? How can we improve um, that performance? Because we really don't have good baseline yet about we have network trainings. We don't even collect right now a lot of information about how many educators access those trainings and then like across the board access those trainings and then what percentage are getting some follow up coaching as a result of it. Nobody's going to be in like TEA jail, but we really want to work together to try to meet those metrics as a network. Awesome. So I think if other questions hit your brain as we're going through the rest of this, go ahead and put them in the chat box and Deanna and Steven will um, answer those. I was going to make a joke about TEA jail. Yeah. I decided not to. So we'll <laughs> continue to keep this professional. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it is getting down to the to the afternoon time here and in the background, you guys just missed the microwave going off a food delivery happening. And so, you know, it's, it's life. This is, you know, this is where we're at. So, um, but uh, those are really great uh, questions. And um, I'm glad that all of that was brought to the table. And don't hesitate to keep that conversation going. Because this really is um, important for shaping what coaching um, is, you know, is going to look like uh, in your context. So. Hi, this is the interpreter. Could we pause for a moment to switch interpreters? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We're good. Thank you so much. All right, uh, just a couple of resources. If you are really interested in getting into the weeds of measuring the fidelity of coach practice, we have some resources for you. But no, this is in the weeds. You are not expected to dive into this. Um, but it's there for you if you're interested in, and really want to learn a little bit more about your coaching practice kind of above and beyond um, the way that we've talked about um, collecting data for TEA at this point in time. So check those out if you're interested.
All right, so we are going to um, do a little bit of a focus on virtual coaching here before we wrap up our time today. This is um, a really, uh, really powerful video from Tom, who is um, one of our SPDIG directors in, um, in Wyoming, and he's going to talk a little bit about his experience with virtual coaching. And I'm going to ask you to think about, as you watch this video, um, I'm going to ask you to think about what is different and what is the same with how we've talked about coaching today. And um, Sarah, do, is there anything you want to say? Um, you know Tom much better than I do. Uh, give a little background or history on, it, on this before we get started. Sure. So actually, um, when you hit the video, it's going to take you to a YouTube. I didn't okay. I don't know how to embed a video in a PowerPoint, but someday I will learn. Uh, so Tom actually will explain how he got into virtual coaching and surprise, it wasn't through COVID. So he's been doing this for a little while and will explain um, his background on virtual coaching and some really good takeaways that um, that I think will be important as we go forward with virtual coaching. Ah, there we go. I was muted and talking. I'm going to start this, but be forewarned, we might kind of have a few bumps in the road before we get to the video. Okay, was that, was that just a check? Was that working? What are you guys looking at? I think you may need to reshare that. Reshare. Okay, that's what I thought. Let me, let me do that. Okay. All right, so now, Sarah, are you looking at Tom? Okay, all right, so I'm going to start it. And then you'll have to, I think, turn up the volume. We'll have to Any sounds? Disconnect your headphones. I know that's happened to me before if I have my headphones connected. You, you may need to share your um, volume for your computer. Yeah, you might have to reshare and share the screen and the computer audio. Jennifer, they're saying you need to stop sharing, and then when you reshare, they'll be like, it'll say like, are you sure you want to reshare? And it'll be like a little box down in the bottom that says something about share your audio as well, I think is what everyone's saying in the chat box. Yeah, stop the share and then reshare the screen and the audio. And there's a box <laughs> in the bottom left, I think. And oh, Tina's like commenting on how great you all are at coaching Jennifer <laughs> and I around this. Okay, can, can you hear me, Sarah? Yes. Okay, so say that again. What do I do? Stop my share, my screen sharing. I'm going to let Samuel tell you because he seems to have a really good way to say it. So stop the screen share, and then you're going to share screen again, and it's going to give you an option on the bottom that says share computer sound also or something like that. So check that box, and then it, it, the sound should come straight from your computer. Because I think right now it's picking up your mic instead of coming from the computer. Great. Okay, let's, let, let's give this a whirl here, folks. I think the coaching question would be, how would disconnecting your uh, headphones help with help <laughs> with us hearing it? Oh, it's not picking that up. All right. When you hit share screen, does it show your, your what the screen you want to share? Then on the bottom left in that box, have share yeah. two boxes. And yeah. One yeah, except for the PowerPoint isn't coming up anymore, and it's embedded in the PowerPoint. I can send out the link to you, Jennifer. Yeah, if you could maybe do that, I think that would be better than you guys uh, suffering through me um, fumbling through this here.
Okay, I just sent out the link. Do you want them to watch it and then we come back together or watch it later? Yeah, you know, is it, um, is it easy for people to watch it like on their own? Will they be able to do that without getting on a Zoom? And are we watching the full 16 minutes? Because I, I, th I thought you said it was shorter than that. I'm fine watching 16 minutes. I just want to know what we should watch. Yeah, no, I would say you can cut it off at about like the 15 minute mark and it might automatically stop. That's what I experienced in the past. Um, so yeah, check out the first 15 minutes of it. Thank you. My apologies for the, the bumps in the road here with the, the technology. Check out that video, please. I think I was able to share it with sound if you want me to play it from my end. Is my screen sharing now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that I would mean, be. I'm not promising anything, but I can give it a try. Go that for it. I'm the personnel development grant director for the Wyoming Department of Education. Um, I've been remotely coaching for about three and a half years. I've been with the department totally for about five. Um, and virtual coaching is something that we rely heavily on in Wyoming because, in addition to our, our long distances, uh, you know, between towns or, or districts. Um, we also, our geography um, with mountain chains and stuff like that kind of prevents a lot of direct line travel. We have to, you know, go way up north and come through a mountain pass. You know, we can drive anywhere from seven to eight hours within the state to get to um, an LEA that needs uh, assistance with coaching. So um, virtual coaching in the state of Wyoming is pretty much a natural extension of, of what we do. Um, I have coached before. Virtual coaching was something new to me uh, about three and a half years ago. I had coached before. My formal coaching and training, uh, coaching training, I'll get it out right here in a second, actually comes from the primary leadership development course in the U.S. Army. And as you may know, the Army model of coaching differs slightly uh, than, you know, accepted civilian types. So, um, you know, there's a slight learning curve there. But um, once I started the with the department, beyond running online uh, classes, I really had very little um, experience in virtual coaching. So my introduction, when I talk about how this kind of got started, it's a funny story. My introduction to virtual coaching was kind of akin to being thrown in the deep end of a pool. And um, how, this, how this really played out is that, again, about three and a half years ago, our department was working and in scaling up our database individualization initiative um, as part of our state systemic improvement plan. And part of that plan was um, designed to establish an internal division-wide coaching cadre um, to work with our, particip our, you know, our participating teachers. So we initially field about, fielded about seven coaches, and each of those coaches was working with about six to seven uh, practitioners. Uh, however, um, and, and unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, natural turnover within the department, within about four months, we had one coach left. Uh, and that was me. Uh, we still had about 40 teachers needing assistance. So, you know, very quickly, uh, I became very acquainted with uh, any and all virtual meeting platforms because obviously there was no way that I was going to be able to make my way around the state um, and, and coach with each of these individual teachers. Um, so, what I was coaching, and, and this is very, I think, important too, because it, it becomes one of the lessons learned down the road, is that we were coaching the implementation process for the database individualization framework. Um, our training at that time, the in-person training we did, really just focused on the core framework. So that meant that our coaching process involved everything else. So we were doing things like intervention selection, um, screening progress monitoring tool adoption, the intervention and progress monitoring. Uh, we put in a little dash of uh, data literacy in there and then a whole lot of database decision making. So it was a, it was a heavy lift to be able to, to, to coach that and then also be, you know, to be doing it for the first time really in a virtual setting. Um, in addition to that, the framework was fairly new to me. Um, I was learning really alongside the teachers that I was expected to coach and again, I had absolutely no experience in virtual delivery. So, um, you know, and I think it's important to note by the end of that year's project, where we had started with close to 50 teachers and after our coaches left, we were down to about 40, 
by the end of that project, we had uh, 26 participating teachers left in our project. So um, lots of lessons learned uh, through that year. That's incredible. That's the first time I've actually heard that whole story. So that's awesome. So Keep showing the video, Deanna. <laughs> Um, and, and that was my first, again, I, I, I like to think that I'm pretty technologically savvy, um, but with a lot of these virtual meeting platforms, uh, they're not all the same and um, not everybody has the same platform. So initially going back three years ago, uh, that, was, that was a huge part of the learning curve. But I think the biggest thing is, and, and I'm really a, and I think most teachers, educators are, is, is a humanist, right? I'm, I'm all about that interpersonal uh, contact and relationship and and for virtual coaching it really is missing that personal touch right there's a lack of proximity um, even within all the wonderful built-in tools in these meeting platforms um, it's just not the same as sitting next to somebody so um, you know I think you run into things like the distractions and one of the things that I realized kind of early on is you are, your presence in a virtual meeting has less impact to the person you're coaching than their immediate surroundings, because that is absolute, that is concrete, and, and you're just a face on the screen. So that's something you kind of have to work to, to get around, and, and I've kind of developed some of my own ideas around that. But um, part of that, too, is that there's, it, it really weakens um expectations, things like timelines or, or you know, that the responsibility component on your mentee, the person you're coaching. So again, something else that we, we've had to work through. Um, I think it's, it's, you have to work twice as hard to build a relationship with these people, because again, you're just a face on a screen. Um, and I, lastly with that, and I mean, I could keep going, but I mean, these are the big ones that I'm thinking about. But lastly, I think time moves differently in a virtual setting. Uh, when I first started coaching where um, face to face, it was, you know, we take an hour to go through the process. And it was almost once we got into a virtual setting, it was almost like a badge of honor to say, hey, I just did that in 15 minutes. And I think you miss a lot of stuff that, that way. So yeah, that's interesting, something I hadn't considered. Um, and knowing, yeah, so, so tell me a little bit, you kind of started to touch on this one as well, but so you've learned some things, right? What are some best practices from the school of Tom Jones when you're doing virtual coaching? Uh, um, and, and I have a couple of them. I think uh, the first one of which is, I don't think this is any different in a face-to-face -face coaching, coaching situation, but I think it is very much more important in a virtual setting. And that is you really have to develop your meeting norms, right? And you have to adhere to them. You have to abide by them. And it's things like make sure your doors close, your cell phones are off, your cameras are on. Um, you have to carve out the time for it. You have, you really, I guess in short, you really have to respect the process, right? And, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about rushing things. It's, it's not really a, a competition to see how quickly you can kind of get in and get out, but you have to respect the process. And I think in doing so, you, you have put that meaning back into the process. Um, the other best practice I learned is being flexible. Um, you have to be responsive. And again, it's the same in, in a face-to-face -face coaching, but I think it's even more important in a virtual coaching scenario because you have to work twice as hard to kind of build that relationship or gain that trust. And so you have to be responsive. You have to be flexible. Um, and, and, you know, and I know we're all busy. I'm busy. I, I've got a lot of other roles that I have to fill. But if I have a, a, a practitioner contact me and they're like, look, I've got questions. Um, I'm at a point where I can't move forward without. I'm, I'm going to have to find time to meet with them. And that's that flexibility component. And, again, I know we're busy, but the more accommodating in a virtual kind of 
setting, setting you're going to be and the more responsive to the needs of your practitioners, um, you know, the more traction you're going to get. It's, that's just, you know, the way it is. Um, I also think that you have to make more frequent contact. Uh, and initially with some of the virtual training we did, we were meeting with our practitioners once every four weeks, and that was looking at data points and, and making decisions and so forth. And, um, but when you're doing it in a virtual setting, my, my recommendation would be much more frequent contact. You know, you need to contact them. Um, you know, what I would do is if I was doing every four weeks on a virtual setting, I would call them probably on the phone every two weeks and send an email every week. And um, really, it's, it's an informal process. I would ensure them. I wouldn't just drop in on them, but I would ensure, like, you know, be expecting a, a call from me on this days or expect an email from me on these days. And I'm really not badgering them about timelines or make sure you have this done. It's more of just a, hey, how are you doing, right? You're going to ask things like, um, do you have any questions, right? Um, how are you doing? Um, let me know if you need anything, because really the point of those more frequent or regular contacts you're making isn't about keeping them on track. It's about keeping you in their mind, right? Again, it, it goes back to that whole idea that you're not as permanent as those concrete or physical things around them. So you have to be more engaged. Um, and then I think I already mentioned the other one too, um, which is time. You know, we things move slower. So you, you have to make a cognitive effort to really slow down um, and go through this. And what I found is, is providing, you know, agendas and, and literally following the agendas and be sure to stop and check for understanding because at least from my perspective, um, I was rushed, but so were they. They're just as, as anxious to get off that call as, as probably as I was originally. So um, it's important that you kind of keep things moving at the pace, you control that and you make sure that you check for understanding on their part. Um, and then last, uh, smile, right? Have energy, be excited when you get on the call. And I am so guilty of this. And, you know, again, things that I kind of figured out the hard way and there were time you'll get on a call and you're kind of leaned up for like, oh, I should have been off an hour ago. That doesn't translate. And even if you think you're having a very informal conversation on a friend level with them along those lines, it, it's ineffective. So you really, once you get on a call with them, you have to act like that they are the first and only thing that you've had to do that entire day and your attention is focused 100% on them and, and their needs. Awesome. So I really like that intentionality around not only checking in with them uh, to build that personal relationship, but I really like what you said about keeping them in the, in your mind, right? Like, like I have this coach, I have somebody to lean on. Um, so you, my last question for you, Tom, is, uh, and you, you spoke about some of these a little bit too, but what are some of the lessons learned um, from both virtual coaching? Um, you did talk about being flexible, which I think is awesome. So, so that's been a lesson learned, I'm sure. Can you speak to some of the other ones? So I probably have uh, two big ones. Um, one of them, is I, I'm sure by now, because remember a lot of this is pre-COVID for me. Um, and so now that we're post-COVID or during COVID, I think a lot of people have already figured this one out, but uh, I, I mean, I didn't like being on camera. And, and at that time, you know, pre-COVID, a lot of people just didn't want to be on camera. And of course now with, because of COVID, we're all, you know, movie stars, camera professionals and so forth. But back then it was very easy to have the camera off. And, and what I figured is, or figured out is that's just another way. I mean, it's already, you're in a virtual setting, you're already distanced from that person and now your camera's off and it's just, it creates a further divide. The camera really has to be on. And, um, and I even mentioned that in kind of setting those meeting norms, the camera has to be on um, because it helps build that. I mean, it, you, it makes you a person, not just this disembodied voice uh, to your practitioner. Uh, and it has to be on both sides. Um, and if, you know, if you haven't figured out, that's kind of my, my angle always, I mentioned I'm a humanist. I love the, the, uh, relationship component of it. And without doing that, um, it's, it really is diff difficult to build a relationship. Um, the, the other big one is really my role. Um, and it's different and it took me a while to figure this out. And that is that my role 
in their world is different than I perceive it. And it kind of goes back to that whole, you know, I'm not physical with them. So I like to think <laughs> that I invented my own coaching model and that it's not true. I think about that about a lot of things, but it ultimately what it is is I've just came up, came to the realization that somebody else already had an idea about, but I give it a different name. And um, so I created my, what I feel again, my own coaching style and I call it progress, a process coaching. Initially how I would coach is, you know, very like instructional coach. I had a little dash of cognitive coaching in there as well, but in a virtual setting, I do this thing I call process coaching where it's still primarily instructional coaching. Um, but I have significantly reduced my role uh, or responsibility in that coaching piece. So when I first meet with my, uh, with my practitioners and I kind of lay down kind of our roles, I, one of the things I, I think we're going to need tell them how over. process coaching, what that means, what I'm bringing to the table. And can we also change interpreters? Yes. Okay. She's found me. Thank you. We're, we're okay to move ahead? Okay, all right, let's see if I can share my screen. There's the slide deck. All right, tell me what you're, what you're looking at. Are you looking at the PowerPoint slides? Yes, all right, let me see if I can get the right presentation. Presentation mode? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was a, an abrupt end point there, but you know we've always, we've always got that that clock uh, chasing our heels. And um, but hopefully you got the gist of what Tom um, has experienced in virtual coaching. So I saw some comments in the chat box, and of course you know we've got some uh, response options for our left-handed participants and our right-handed participants. But let's uh, let's just hear your global thoughts as well. Um, and I'm interested in. Uh, also, your, the differences and similarities of how we've talked about coaching versus how Tom has talked about coaching in, in the video, um, but then also your key takeaways. So let's, let's hear over the, the chat or also the phone line. Let's, let's get some of, that, um, some of those reactions out. And Sarah, I'm not able to see the chat again. Sorry. Uh, so similarity, a lot of people are talking about building relationships, um, having more contact, making sure that that camera is on. Um, I know that, you know, pre-COVID, I never did that myself anyway. And so now post-COVID or, you know, in the middle of COVID, uh, it's even more important. Um, a lot of people are talking about those relationship and that personal connection. Um, so some similarities there would definitely hit the relational or the alliance aspect of the coaching dynamic. And what about differences? I'd love to hear uh, over the phone line or in the chat box about things that you, that you think are different from how um, Tom approaches coaching to how we talked about it today. I liked how he said he has he has his own his own approach to it. Where I sometimes think, I sometimes think you're able to use your personality, your style to kind of make it your own, to help yourself, help the teacher or whoever you're trying to coach. Um, because I think sometimes one way doesn't work for everybody, and I think being able to be flexible, um, with still having the end result in mind, uh, I think helps. I liked how he kind of just took it and kind of made it his own. Or he even said, "I didn't really invent it. I just kind of put my own spin on it." Thanks for sharing that, um, Samuel. Um, yeah, you're getting at, at one of the differences there, uh, a little bit of a difference there where um, he still talks about the flexibility of coaching practice and putting his own spin on it. And absolutely, I hope that is one of your key takeaways from today is that your coaching style might differ from anyone, everyone else here on this, on this call. And that is okay. Um, and there are um, those four core practices that if we expect to see, you know, it's what is our end goal? If we expect to see improvements in teaching and student learning, then we know 
know what to incorporate and how we do that can vary. And that's where our styles and our approaches, just like with teaching, we know that there is a science of teaching and there are core practices that effective teachers use that lead to improved student outcomes. And the same can be said of coaching, but every teacher's classroom is going to look slightly different than another teacher's classroom. And we embrace those differences. Thanks for drawing that out, Samuel. Other, other things that you pulled up in um, from Tom's video? So I really like what Lisa says in the chat. She said that there's that importance of building relationships in both models is obviously key to success. It just may look a little bit different between virtual and face-to-face. -face. So I know that's not a, it's a difference. There's still components there, but it may look a little different. Right, absolutely. Yeah, how we interact is different face-to-face um, -face and virtual, and that's just the, in any kind of context, including coaching. This is Daniel from Region 13. Can you hear me this time? Hi, Daniel. Hi. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I thought one of the points he made that was really good is the uh, duration and frequency changes that happen from in-person versus virtual. I'm signaling that you might have to do more frequent visits um, with maybe lower uh, timelines or, or smaller uh, durations uh, for more effectiveness. I thought that was an interesting point you made. Yeah, thanks for picking up on that. It's those nuances and those adjustments that we are making and kind of figuring out in the moment and based on what's happening with the teachers, those changes in the teacher's practice. And then, you know, of course, factoring in the relational pieces. Do we have folks on the line who um, have experienced virtual coaching and have their own lessons that they've learned that they can share with colleagues here? You know, I haven't done virtual coaching yet, but I think from just in, in virtual world and doing presentations and, and PD in it, is you don't know what the other person's technology setup looks like. So what you might be working with, they might not have access to that or their internet might not be as fast or their webcam isn't as, not as good, but they might not have a webcam. So I think it's always to be cognizant of what their setup is like. Cause you might be trying to coach and do something, you, might, you know, like kind of like we're doing with the, trying to share the video is what should be on the bottom left. But if they're using a Mac and you're using a PC, it might not be there. So I think just being aware of who you're gonna coach and what their setup is like also. And then also, their level of technology use you know some I think one thing COVID showed is you could be a great in-person teacher but you might not be good at using the computer very well you know you might not be good at searching Google um, so I know I had a learning curve searching Google so I think that's very important is understanding who you're trying to coach but the coaching could be could be interrupted in a sense by that technology gap by the, the use of terms of technology you know the use of you know now you got TikTok and Google and all the other stuff kids are using, they might not be aware of that. You know, I learned a lot about um, Seesaw. I never knew what Seesaw was until I started working with teachers virtually, you know. So stuff like that, I think, is to be aware of it, to do virtual coaching is what's their setup look like and then what's their knowledge level of technology that they, that they either have or ha are still learning. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Samuel. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that this highlights from, from what you're saying is that you have experts in, um, in this network, well, beyond your own network and across the colleagues who are here participating on this call. So or if you are just getting your feet wet with that virtual coaching piece and need some guidance or tips or, you know, have some conversations and um, get the lay of the land a little bit more deeply, then rely on each other for sure because it sounds like some of you have have been in the trenches of virtual coaching and, and can offer some support to each other. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move us forward here um, just to kind of make sure that we've uh, tie a little bit of a bow around our time today and make sure that um, people are clear on what it is, is that will happen after this session because we are not going away. <laughs> we will see you again or we will hear your voices and you will hear our voices again, which is, I know, really an important part um, of making this uh, go beyond that one-shot wonder that we know is not going to help to 
lead to any kind of changes in implementation. So after today, what, um, what can you expect? And for those of you who are actually coaching and going to serve in that coaching role, this is your post-session task list. So we're going to ask that you find a coaching partner within your network and virtually meet with that person um, and uh, come up with some coaching ahas that you've had, any questions, um, you know, the whole laundry list of questions that you might have, and then any needs. Again, thinking about the reality of, of coaching um, in today's uh, context, what is it that you will need to be successful? And then developing a bit of a timeline, um, just to be highly detailed, it can be very high level, but when you anticipate you would be able to begin this three-step coaching cycle with teachers, when you and your partner will meet, and how you will help each other use coaching cycles um, that incorporate those four effective coaching practices while also uh, still being flexible. And then you're going to provide all of this information to um, your network leads by 10-7, October 7th, which, by the way, is just right around the corner, a couple of weeks from now. So that is um, kind of the to-do list for the network um, coaches. And then for network leads, oh, there's the microwave in the background. <laughs> ding, ding, almost there. Um, for the network leads, we will have a meeting with you coming up um, shortly after, about a week after um, this, the date here of 10-7, so that would be on the 14th. And um, we will provide some information to you about what will happen on that call and what we can um, do to help you prepare for that and what you will need to do to prepare, prepare for that call coming up. All right, so this is our last uh, couple of opportunities to make sure that we are clear on the, the key takeaways and any kind of action steps that you are going to take after this, se this session. So on, in your own notes, please just make um, jot down some ideas of what action steps you will take and then any takeaways. And I would love to hear your key takeaways just so that I can um, get a better sense uh, in the moment of how this information has landed for you and um, for you today uh, and if you could put that into the chat box or over the phone line um, I would definitely appreciate hearing that and um, if you have a PDF of the handouts I'm, I'm just gonna fast forward here you can see that we've got some resources I'm not gonna spend time going over them today but please feel free to check those out um, we've got some uh, magazine or journal articles rather as well as some online tools to support coaching but I'm going to go back to this final thought because that is um, important for, uh, for me to hear. I'd love to, to end on hearing your voice rather than mine about any of your um, key takeaways and ahas and action steps, as well as any final questions or comments. So I saw uh, questions coming up in the chat just about they're asking a lot of people are a part of more than one network. And so if you're if you're a part of multiple net networks, you don't have to do this for every one of the networks. So just pick one, pick one of the networks that you're involved in and, and, and do this homework with just that one network. Thanks for that clarification, Stephen. So key takeaway, Tammy, relationships are key in both face-to-face -face and virtual coaching. Twinkle is gonna um, check out the resources. That's her action step. Um, Takeaways, how to adapt a coaching model for evaluation of personnel. Coaching is intentional and needs planning. I'm doing my bobblehead thing if you're not looking at me. So yes, this is fantastic. Thank you. April's going to use um, her action step is to use, uh, be using for opportunities to use these coaching techniques deliberately. And her takeaway really was that alliance building strategies are her first step in any coaching experience. Yeah, I think a lot of people picked up what you were putting down, which is relationships are important. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm combing through these. A lot of them are saying relationships, quality, not quantity. Any final questions or, or just things that you've got to wrap up before and, and get clear in your mind before we... Um, head on to the next part of your day.
All right. Well, I am going to say thank you at this time. And um, I want to thank uh, all of you for being a part of this call and TEA staff and Sarah, my colleague at um, AIR, for being a part of this, of planning this and helping to put this on and being my uh, savior, my technology savior. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to say that my issues were PC versus uh, Mac, but they were not. So I can't, I can't claim that. <laughs> uh, but I also want to encourage you um, to complete the survey that um, we will be giving out to you. We're going to put it in the chat box. You'll also get it emailed to you, but take the time right now to do it before you uh, move on to the next thing. That'll be coming in the chat box to you. And um, also know that you can reach out to, to me, to Sarah, to both of us at any time. We are here to talk with you, work with you, support you in any way. You can filter your questions or needs up to uh, your network leads or to Stephen or D. Deanna, and they can po pass those on to us um, as well. But we'd love to hear from you and um, really appreciate all of the work that you're doing out there. Um, you know, the, the work of an educator is just constantly shifting and changing and always so difficult and challenging. And we applaud you for everything that, that you are doing. So um, with that, I will end my session with you today. And don't forget to complete your survey and reach out to us. And I'll, I'll say goodbye. I'll stay on the line for a little bit longer. But um, I think Stephen and Deanna have got, they're not done with you yet. So I don't think we can quite <laughs> hop off the line. I'll, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and I think from everybody, this, this was really great. Y'all did a really, really super job. I, I, I loved it. And hopefully everybody got, got a lot of it. And I really appreciate you putting all the work and all the uh, into this and the, and the time to meet with us today. Because I know it was a lot, big part of your day today. So we really appreciate it. And so, okay, so we have uh, about two minutes until our next presenter, I saw her jump in, uh, is going to be uh, Lyndon Kish. And she's from our instructional leadership team. And uh, she will, uh, she's just gonna give some tips on creating uh, courses and modules with adult learning in mind. And so uh, she's already pulling up her stuff, that's great. And so uh, but really the only people that need to be on this part are the, uh, the network leads and network grantees. So the, the leads of those networks and their, their leadership uh, teams. And so everybody else, you know, thank you for joining us today. And this will be posted if you ever wanna go back and, and look at it. We'll probably email it out along with the the handouts and the survey and all that stuff will send all in one big email. And so, but if you want to drop off, but if the network leads and grantees can stay on to uh, listen to, to uh, Lyndon's um, presentation about adult learning. So, uh, and if you don't mind, can we give them like three minutes, uh, Lyndon? You know, I know it's going to put you a little bit past two o'clock. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No problem. All right. So let's, let's just make, let's just say, uh, I'll make it a weird number and say, let's start back at 203. If you want to run to the restroom and grab something to drink and then we'll be, we'll be back. Provide any um, intro or context before I jump in. And if not, totally cool too. Oh, I think you're still muted from my end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, let me give a little uh, quick introduction and, and, or just explanation about why we added this part uh, and, and give thanks to you for joining us because it was definitely on short notice. So um, the reason we did this is because the, uh, we, we were presenting some of our, our um, things that we're doing from the network to the commissioner. And one of those things was some orientation and mobility uh, courses and modules that the, our, our sensory support network was creating. And he suggested that we run it by our instructional leadership team to make sure it's using all of the good um, adult learning techniques that, that they have been doing for other things, I'm sure, and, and training people over. And so uh, Lyndon uh, think, was think, thankful enough to help, to help us with that and gave us a lot of good feedback. And as she was giving her feedback, I instantly popped in my mind, like, we have like eight other networks that are also doing things like this. And so it'd be great if they could hear this, these same tips and the same message for the courses and modules they're gonna be creating. So I just asked her on the spot, hey, can you come next week? Uh, we're meeting all these people anyways for a coaching training. And she said, yes, of course, sure. And I, and I double checked to make sure, is that enough time? You sure you can do that? And she, she graciously said yes. So that's why she's here. And that's why I was kind of added at the last minute. So we really appreciate 
uh, Lyndon taking the time to, to come in and talk with us for the next 30 minutes. And hopefully, uh, I think it will be uh, something valuable for when y'all are creating those modules and courses uh, in your networks for your for adult learners. So, all right, there you go. Go ahead, Lyndon. Awesome. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it's really quite a privilege to be with you all today. And I think the work that you're doing across the state is so important. So if I can be a small, tiny, tiny part of that for the next 30 minutes, then it's really a highlight of my week, I have to say. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm brand new as the Director of Instructional Leadership here at the TEA, I'm heading up the division that is tasked with building capacity across the state primarily with uh, all the wonderful folks who work at the Education Service Centers. And uh, prior to joining the TEA team, I spent the past six years working for a nonprofit up in Dallas that did nothing but leadership development. So we coached district leaders, principal managers, principals, and leadership teams at campuses all across North Texas. Um, and throughout the course of those six years, what I'm gonna talk about today really became my passion. It became you know, kind of the bread and butter of how I spent Monday through Friday. My husband would tell you that this is stuff that I like to talk about all the time. I'm just so passionate about how we can make the best use of adult educators time and education leaders time when it comes to training and conveying information and providing learning opportunities for people who are doing really important work across the state. So um, that's what we do in our instructional leadership department. Um, and this is big work. So the topic I'm touching on today, we're gonna talk 30 minutes and I'm gonna provide you with a really succinct checklist. So when you're creating modules, any type of adult learning experience really where you're trying to convey information, this is a checklist you're gonna be able to use. I'm gonna provide you with some very specific questions that you can ask yourself to double check um, whether or not you're being uh, as strategic as possible and as strategic as you wanna be in designing those experiences. It's also a checklist that you could potentially use when colleagues ask you for feedback um, or when you're talking as a team about the kind of learning experiences you are working to put out there and to provide for adults that you work with out in the field. Um, just personally speaking, I am, uh, I love Austin. My family and I live in Austin. We have two little boys, a two-year-old and a six-month-old. He's six months old today. Um, so that's kind of who I am. I, um, I, love, I love being a Texan and getting to work with all the great folks that are doing stuff for kids in this state. So um, let's jump in with just first kind of a quick poll. I'd love to can hear we, from you. Before you do this, can we swap interpreters quickly? Yes. Absolutely. No problem. All right. You good to go, Tracy? Not quite yet. No, no, Not yet. Okay. I'm trying to move so it might help her find me quicker. Sure, sure. We're good. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Okay, so let's start with a quick poll. And I want to hear from you all. Reflecting on your experiences as participants in trainings, what I refer to as adult learning experiences, any type of training over the years, what percentage of information would you say you retain on average from any given training? So just throw a percentage out there. And you can chat that here in the Zoom. Great. So everyone wants to hop over to the chat and take a look at what people are sharing. Great. Okay, so generally speaking, we see about 10 to 50% of information from any given training is retained. And good news, that's, um, that's, it's pretty in line with what we know about learning in general, and particularly adult learning. There's actually been a lot of research done on this. And part of that research has been put into um, a, a nice kind of concept called the curve of forgetting. So you can see here in this graph, on day one, at the beginning of a training, you go in knowing, let's say, nothing on any given topic. And at the end of the training, you've retained 100% of what you've learned. Okay, so at the end of, let's say, an hour long session, 100% of what you've learned or absorbed is in your brain. By day two, you can see how much that drops off in this graph. If you've done nothing with the information you learned during that session, you didn't think about it again, you didn't read about it again, you will have lost 50 to 80% is what the research tells us 
of what you learned during that session by the end of that hour long session, say. Our brains are constantly recording information on a temporary basis. Snippets of your favorite TV show, what you need to buy at the grocery store, maybe that cool new shirt that you saw your boss wearing in your latest Zoom meeting. All sorts of information is coming at us constantly. And because of this rapid influx of information, your brain doesn't easily hold on to everything that it's learned for very long. And unfortunately, you can see at the end of this graph here by day seven and day 30, by day seven, we remember even less and then only about three to 7% of an initial hour long training is retained by day 30, a month after you engaged in that learning. So I say that to say that how strategic we are in designing these learning experiences is really important because Already we know that we're up against our brains. Our brains aren't programmed to hold on to every single bit of information. We're not computers, we're not robots. Um, so we need to be really intentional about how we're utilizing this time that we have in front of adults and with other adults. So more specifically, uh, by in the, within the, and again, I, I'm gonna make this succinct and, and hopefully you're gonna learn a lot in just this next 20 minutes, but you're gonna be able to identify three key criteria that help stamp the learning in a training session. And you'll be able to reflect on your own experiences designing adult learning sessions and where you might want to improve and or learn a bit more. Okay, so um, here they are. Three keys to adult learning. And when we think about sessions like the modules that I've worked with Steven and his team on, sessions, trainings that are information rich, these are the three things we pay attention to. So I do want to caveat that there are le adult learning sessions that are practice based. So for a very simple example, if we are teaching educators how to write lesson plans, for example, we'd want that to be a strong practice based training where they're actually getting time to do the work, to write the lesson plans and everything that goes along with it. So I want to be clear that over the next 20 minutes, we're talking about information rich sessions um, and what I believe is common in your work, producing modules to convey critical information to stakeholders. So number one, we look to see that the objectives for the learning session, the training are clear, clear objectives. Number two, we look to make sure that the information is digestible in the amount of time given. And finally, we look to make sure that participants are given multiple opportunities to reflect, to check their understanding, and to apply the learning in their own context. So let's jump into number one. Are the objectives of the training clear? So again, I want to state that nothing in this training is probably going to be new to you in terms of your thinking, but my purpose here is to provide you with an easy to use checklist. So I'm well aware everyone here is, knows what a session objective is, um, but we're gonna develop a common language here in order to get to that objective of getting this checklist that's gonna be usable as we design sessions. So the question to ask yourself here as you're designing a training or giving feedback to a peer or direct report is what is the goal for how participants will use the information presented. What do you want them to do with the information that you're sharing by the time the training is over? So most often what I see when I'm given opportunities to review sessions and give feedback is I see an agenda. What's gonna be covered? What are the topics covered in this hour long or day long or three day long training session? And here's an example. So here are topics that might be covered in a session around instructional planning. But what we don't see here is how we want the participants to utilize this information. All we have are the topics themselves. So here's a sample set of what we mean by session objectives. And could someone in the group take yourself off mute and read these for us out loud? I can read them. Great, thanks Rosario. By the end of this training, participants will be able to write high quality daily lesson objectives using a five step process that begins with unpacking the TEKS. Analyze student data gained from TEKS aligned daily exit tickets in order to address next week's instruction. Okay, great. So you can see these are tangible. These are things that participants will be able to do 
with this information that you see here in this sample agenda I've provided. Okay, so here are the topics in the sample agenda. And then here's what we would want participants in that session to be able to do by the end of it. So here's another example. We see objectives, session objectives on the left and a sample agenda on the right. Just take 30 seconds and read that to yourself. Okay, so as you see these two side by side, strong session objectives and then an agenda, session agenda, let's pause and reflect here. What's the difference between an agenda and session objectives? Should be obvious. And what do you think is the benefit of having both? We don't often see both in training sessions, or I don't, um, in my work. As I've kind of shared with you, I get the pleasure of reviewing uh, a lot of adult learning sessions. I don't often see both, but what would be the benefit of having both an agenda and session objectives? For example, what you see here on this slide. So take just 30 seconds and reflect on these two questions. And then I'll ask two or three people to unmute themselves and share with the group. Okay, who'd like to share out? What are your thoughts here? I'll start. Um, Thanks, Vicki. The agenda is basically the list of activities that you're going to be doing that day. And the session objectives are what you are wanting the participants to get out of the activities. Great, excellent. And Vicki, do you have thoughts on what might be the benefit of having both of those as opposed to maybe just one or the other? Absolutely. Uh, when I look at an agenda, it's not always obvious to me what it is I'm supposed to get out of it and do with it. If I only see the objectives, it still doesn't tell me what my training day is going to look like. Thank you, Vicki. Other thoughts? I'll share one. Thanks, Stacy. So I think the agenda for me kind of activates prior knowledge. It helps me kind of grasp what I already know about the topic. It provides a framework for those topics. But that objective um, gets me thinking about my responsibilities. So those are the things I'm responsible for leading uh, with. And that kind of sets up uh, my learning moving forward where the objective agenda, I'm sorry, kind of makes me look backward at what I already know. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. One more person. Any Can thoughts add, on? I would like to add. So I'm, I'm seeing it. Um, I thought of it as both the presenter and a participant. So as a presenter, it keeps me on target, having both. And, and um, I, having the agenda makes me make, make sure, makes me make sure that I am going towards my, my goals, my objectives. And as a participant, I guess I'm just gonna ditto what has been said. <laughs> Great, in terms of helping a participant kind of manage their own learning, activate prior knowledge, know what their yes. responsibilities are in the training. Great. Thank you all for sharing out. Yeah, so all, everything that you just shared, the rationale for having both the side by side is what we should be talking about when we are giving feedback to peers or talking with our teams about our goals for designing adult learning sessions. Okay, so that was number one. Are the objectives for the session clear? Number two. Is the information presented clearly and at the appropriate level of detail? Another word for this is digestible. Is the information digestible? So ask yourself this question when you're designing a session or giving feedback on someone else's session. Will participants be able to digest the amount of information provided in the amount of time given? Now, this seems like a simple question. It can be one of the most difficult things to manage because you have to put yourself in the shoes 
of the participants. They may have varying levels of expertise. Uh, they may be dealing with different contexts out in the field in their work, which causes them to show up in a session in a different way. So we really have to be strategic about ensuring the information we're providing is digestible. It's not too much. And here we wanna consider two things. The amount of information on each slide, for example, or whatever platform you're using, the amount of information presented in each piece of the training and the amount of information in the training as a whole. So here's where it's not uncommon for us to say, we need to split this up. This is too much for an hour long session, or this is too much to cover in one day. We need to present some information, allow folks to go out and process and practice, and then we need to reconvene to present the rest of it. Really important questions to be asking. So here's an example of just that first consideration, how much information is provided on a given slide. Here's a good example of um, where we'd want to limit ourselves, stop ourselves from, from overloading what people are seeing in this piece of a session. So this slide looks really good. This one, not so good. All right, so as you're giving feedback and designing your sessions, be cognizant of what it looks like, what your slides look like, and how your participants are going to be able to digest the information you're getting across or working to get across. Okay, so let's move on to, this is really the biggest, and we're gonna spend the rest of our time on number three, criteria number three. Participants can reflect, check their understanding, and apply the learning. So ask yourself, am I providing multiple opportunities for participants to pause and reflect, check their understanding, and apply the information to their context? This is the most difficult because in traditional models of professional development, this is the easiest part to leave out. So you're designing a session, you are in some position of expertise, and you know what information you have to get across. And generally speaking, we're pretty good. If we're the expert in the room, because we're leading a session, we're pretty good at determining what we need to get across. Where we're not as good is making sure we're inputting those opportunities for folks to do these three things. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why they're so critical. But first, here are some examples. Reflection prompts and a whole group share out. So we just saw an example of that in this session when I asked you to consider those two questions and then share your thoughts with the group. A quick poll, we've also already seen an example of that in this session. Small group discussion, uh, which fortunately is really easy to do over Zoom. I've been a part of a lot of those in trainings I've attended. Really helpful, even in virtual settings, as well as practice opportunities. So let's look at each of these a little bit more closely. Here are some sample reflection questions. Can someone unmute and read these three bullets for us, please? This is Stephanie Walker, and I would be happy to do that. Um, the slide says reflect. How is the information, pr information presented connected to what you already know? Next bullet, what new ideas have you learned in this training? And finally, what questions or wonderings do you have about what's been presented? Yeah, so thank you so much, Stephanie. So you can see that these are three reflection questions that are arguably applicable in any content you're gonna present. So it's as easy as just popping in this slide and letting folks read the prompts and giving them three or four minutes, depending on how long the training is, to just answer these questions. Uh, better yet, if you can combine it with a small group discussion, let people talk to one another and share their ideas, but at least come back together and let two to three people share out whole group. And the idea here why this is so important is if you want people to remember the learning, give them time to process it. We've all been in those trainings where it's just talk, 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 talk. You know, it's like the lectures that we sat through in college. Um, you don't get any time to let the information sink in or to really think about it. And we know from research that the more we can process, the higher our retention of the information is going to be. So here's the, that next example was quick poll. You saw an example at the beginning of the session, but here's another one. We would just ask, which of the following tools can help a coach identify the principal's action step? It would give some choices and then ask participants to share their answer in the chat. So this is a content specific. This is a, this is a true check your content we just shared about in the training. And then we'd pause and let people 
see how much they're getting. Are you still with us? Is this clicking? That's the purpose of the quick poll. Here's another sample that gets a little bit more into, um, it's more subjective and allows for a little bit more discussion. In which of the following scenarios do you anticipate this tool being most helpful? So there's no right answer in this quick poll. And there doesn't always have to be a right answer. That's not really what the quick poll um, has to be for. In this scenario, we're asking people to apply the learning to their context. We've just taught you a tool. Now think about the work that you do day to day. Where is this tool going to be most helpful? So ask yourself this. We don't have time to share out today, but what would be the benefit of allowing someone to answer a question like this during a training? Okay, hopefully you're thinking of a lot of things. People are starting to think about the implementation and putting what they're learning into action. Big benefits there as opposed to saying at the very end of a session, okay, now go out and think about what this is going to look like for you um, when they're moving on to the rest of their day and they've got other things on their mind. Make time for that in the training and you're going to get um, a lot more retention of the learning. Okay, and then sample small group discussion questions here. And this is tied also directly to folks' context. We see that the questions are, what do you anticipate being the biggest roadblocks to implementation with your district? Where in the process do you think those challenges will surface? And why do you think those challenges will arise? What's the root cause? So really critical questions, getting people to think about what this looks like in real life. And then sample practice opportunities. Um, script the first two sections of your coaching conversation. So like I said at the beginning, we want to provide practice as often as possible. Every training session where it makes sense, we want to let folks do it, actually get their hands dirty and practice whatever there's, whatever's being taught. So um, here's what this might look like. Write a script of just a small section of a coaching conversation. How will you get the principal to see their action step in action through a model? That's one prompt. How will you ensure that the principal unpacks the model fully? So you can see we would at this point give folks 20, 30 minutes, whatever's appropriate, to go and do this, to go and script these sections, keeping in mind the prompts that you've provided here. Um, and I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, the question from Kara or Kara is, are there suggestions? recommendations for reflection or applying the learning in asynchronous modules. We incorporate checks for understanding through multiple choice questions, but are there additional suggestions? Yes, um, we, we have done asynchronous work here. Then I think the suggestions are to provide the questions, prompt people to pause the training and capture their thoughts in some type of template that they will then share back with someone on their team share back with um, some point of contact where they can either get feedback or where that point of contact can just use it, use that information to measure the efficacy of the training. So that's what we typically do. We provide the, the prompts, say pause for 10 minutes, capture your thoughts in your template. But we, we find providing some type of template, a guided notes is what we typically call it, um, is a good way to do that in asynchronous learning. And if there are any other suggestions from the group, please uh, add those to the chat. We can get some more ideas out there. Great question. And I, I meant to say too that everything I've put in these slides today, we are doing on my team in virtual learning, every single thing. So yeah, Stephanie loves guided notes, me too. Um, so everything is applicable in, in Zoom trainings, if you will, or these kind of you know, semi-live trainings. Um, the modules, the asynchronous modules, I think all of this too is applicable. Um, of course, the objectives, that one's applicable. The time to reflect, we just talked about that one. Um, and making sure the information is digestible, of course, is super, super important in those okay, asynchronous perfect. models. We're just going to switch real quickly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're good to go. Okay, awesome. Okay, so that was the final example of this point number two, which is allow time to reflect check understanding and apply context to the learning. Those are four ways that you can do that virtually any setting. 
And the idea here with this point number three is to ensure the maximum amount of learning is retained, we must be strategic and intentional about the design of adult learning experiences. And a really high leverage way to do that is to make sure that you check. Are you providing opportunities for participants to pause and reflect? Are you providing opportunities for them to check their understanding? And are you providing opportunities for them to start to apply the learning to their own context? Um, so here they are again. Your, this is your short checklist. Again, probably not new information, but maybe you haven't thought about it in, um, in kind of just like a quick and easy way to look at what you design and what others on your teams are designing. So I hope this is a helpful tool as you go out and continue in your work. Um, and so one last point here, if we can just take these final two minutes, capture your thoughts from this past 30 minutes of learning. What's something that you noticed, maybe something you're encouraged by, maybe something you're still wondering, or something you still need as it relates to designing high quality learning experiences for adults. And just chat that out in the Zoom chat for us. You don't have to do all four of them, just pick one and share your thoughts with the group. All right, awesome. Well, I'll close this out. And if folks want to keep adding to the chat or reading others' responses, then I think you're welcome to. Thank you all for sharing these thoughts. Um, I think when I design sessions for uh, the wonderful ESC folks we get to work with, um, it does help me to stick to a checklist and do a double checking because I, I think we can move so quickly and we have so many deadlines and plates are so full that when we can break it down like this for ourselves and for our teams and those that we support, um, we're more likely to get to a high quality product. And I would also say that I do try to keep it simple. You know, as you saw in these 30 minutes, there's a lot, a lot you can do with just um, asking folks to unmute, share out the quick poll, the reflection prompts. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that I don't have to get too, too fancy with technology because that's not where my strengths lie necessarily. Um, but you can do a lot with just Zoom and um, hopefully this gets the wheels turning and some ideas for your asynchronous modules uh, and what you can do there to really engage folks and stamp that learning. So thanks so much. Um, yes, Stephen has my slides and he has my permission to share them. So use them, use them as much as you like, if it's helpful. All right, thank you very much, Lyndon. Did it, you're right on time, it's 2.33, that was 30 minutes. So <laughs> appreciate you, yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate you again for coming on short, short notice. And, and thank you to everybody that was able to stay because I know we had a long day and it's hard to sit in front of a computer and a, on a Zoom meeting for, you know, since 9 a.m. this morning until 2.30. So, uh, but thank you all. Hope you hope you got a lot, of, a, lot out, a, a lot out of it. If I can talk, see, I can't talk anymore. And uh, we will get the, the, the video sent out soon with all the attachments, all the PowerPoints, all the uh, surveys and things that you need. We'll put it in one big long email. We'll get out as soon as possible. So I won't keep you any longer. Everybody have a very good rest of your day and, and good weekend if I don't talk to you again. Thank you very much.